but uh, very warm good morning once again. Thank you. Secretary uh, Simon Chelugi, who is now with us uh, at short notice uh, because he believes this is uh, one of the most important uh, issues uh, Africa confronts, human capital development. Uh, so today we are gathered here to uh, brainstorm about ongoing uh, research project by ARC, uh, which is uh, on human capital development, uh, funded by the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, so my name is Abba Shimelis. Uh, most of you know me here in the room. I'm director of research. So it's my pleasure to introduce now first uh, the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, keynote address uh, uh, on the topic and also to encourage us to continue on this research, uh, the path we have taken. Your Excellency, uh, very glad we have you among us uh, and for your kind uh, acceptance of the invitation we have extended to you. So, sir, uh, maybe Professor Juguna, you introduce him. Uh, yes, maybe I think that's better. Uh, as you know, Juguna is executive director of ARC. So let me. Thank you very much, Abebe, and thank you, uh, my friend CS Simon Cherugui. Is a CS Reba, uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection. And some can say a lot of good things about what has happened during the COVID and social protection later. But for now, I wanted first of all to actually make a few opening remarks that re relates to this subject matter, and also for the CS to see what ARC has been doing, and specifically what ARC is doing right now with the support of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is a project that we dub it as uh, building policy research institutions to support human capital development in Africa. We, what, we cover sub-Saharan Africa. I hope I can use this. Yeah, we cover sub-Saharan Africa, but let me say a few words about um, that. First of all, the African Economic Research Consortium. We are a capacity building uh, and knowledge generation network in sub-Saharan Africa, and we want to promote evidence-based policy making. We want to do this through research, and we encourage young researchers to enter our thematic research. We have five diverse groups. Some of the research persons are also here. We want to encourage collaborative research, uh, like the one we are, doing, we, we are covering right now. And we also support graduate training in public universities in Sub-Saharan Africa. We want to support graduate training in uh, graduate economics in, in three main programs. We have collaborative master's program in economics, we have collaborative master's in agriculture and applied economics, and we have collaborative PhD program. What we do is actually to provide curricula to public universities and help them mount quality degree program. So we, we combine research, capacity building through research and graduate training. We actually believe that we can increase the supply of policymakers, we can increase the supply or we can have a critical mass in policy institutions, in think tanks, and even in universities, so that we can actually support strong institutions and even that, uh, that, that are going to contribute in terms of policy making. But above all, we have communications and policy outreach, whose role is to, to, to disseminate the work that we do. Having said all that about ARC, we are going to run more. Oh, which, way, which way does it respond? Oh, it's there. Then we talk about the objectives of this uh, collaborative research project. This research project is supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it's on human capital development in Africa. And what we want is actually to generate evidence on the challenges of building human capital to accelerate inclusive development in sub-Saharan Africa. We also want to see how we can address the key constraints on human capital accumulation, such as weak public financial management, as well as service delivery. But that, our approach is very, very important because collaborative research in our, A, in, in our AERC technology has three steps. The first one is actually to develop 
frontier knowledge papers. We call them framework papers. So, uh, Waziri, the people you, the researchers you find here are actually going to, dis to discuss the framework papers. We want to use the frontier knowledge from framework papers to guide country case studies. And more, even this, t this particular time, we also want to target national think tanks because they are developed, funded by governments to advise them. So we do believe that when we address and work with the national think tanks, we can create a very strong platform for policy influence. And the third stage is that we want to actually disseminate to senior policy makers, and we want them to commit because we have the frontier knowledge, we have evidence from the case studies that allows us to package policies, and we even ask senior policymakers to actually commit to implementation. And that's why the AERC, Collaborative Research Project uh, Modality, or uh, Delivery Modality, is very, very critical to policy making. So we want to make sure that appropriate policies uh, can be developed and implemented, but we do know that in Africa, the constraint on human capital development is very, very strong. So we need to see how can we create a better environment for them. I don't know which it responds to, but anyway. <laughs> I'll keep trying. OK, good. What is the plan for this project design? First of all is to undertake uh, some set of reinforcing activities in seven sub-Saharan sub African countries. We have Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, Burkina Faso, Senegal, and Madagascar. These are the primary countries. But the most important thing is that once we start disseminating, we want to encourage researchers in the other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to replicate what we have done. And those activities will be developed, uh, will develop a case for greater policy support on human capital development in Africa. So, so it is a way of showcasing. And we want to make sure that uh, in the, the influence on human capital development policies are actually felt across and they will help us strengthen African policy-making institutions, especially the national think tanks. And that is why we focus on them. And for us, that is very, very critical. Um, then, why, why do we focus on human capital development in Africa? First, Africa has perhaps the lowest in terms of, if you look at regions, in terms of human capital development indicators. And they can be explained by various factors, but here let's focus on three of them. And one of them is survival. And the question we ask ourselves is, will children born today survive up to school age? Second, school. How much school will children complete, and how much will they learn, and how much will they use? And third, this is the health issue. Will they leave school in general uh, in, in good health, are they going to be ready? Are they running? Can they apply that in work? And we have so many things. But in, in totality, we do believe that after all that is achieved, the diversity of opportunities as well as economic vibrancy will drive the future success in even career development for the youth, something that we have to ponder. The next point I want to make on this, if, oh, sorry, oh, now I, I've moved faster. The next point I want to make about this is how human capital, especially education, skills, and health, are crucial for development in African com economies. It, it, plays a very, it, it can play a very pivotal role, pivotal role in terms of economic transformation in African economies. Some of the debate I've seen in the last, for example, five years is to ask why economic transformations has not taken place in Africa. There are some people who blame the development model, others who blame the institutions and others, so many aspects of that. But I, we do believe investment in human beings is going to be important and can improve the socioeconomic outcomes in future. And it's also going to be vital in terms of shaping uh, incomes and, as well as productivity in individual countries and even in sectors. And we know that Sub-Saharan Africa sc scores the lowest when it comes to the world's regions on the human capital index. But we do know that many African countries have signaled aspirations to improve that and to improve the index. The whole issue is that we can make a contribution with this project in terms of, of how that can be done. And we are going to be vocal in terms of what this seminar, for example, today is going to guide the, case the country case studies. 
And we do also know that we are starting at a point where the COVID-19 has wiped out most of the gains that have been covered in the last two decades or so. In fact, we argued that the efforts in terms of poverty reduction and inequality has actually been wiped out for the last two decades, have been wiped out by the COVID-19. So when we talk about post-COVID economic recovery uh, agenda, we may first of all start by saying how do we recapture human capital development indexes or policies that are going to improve human capital development? How do we recapture so many other aspects? Everybody is talking about fiscal space, everybody is talking about debt resolution, everybody is talking about the development model, and we also take advantage of that to actually talk about reforms in various institutions. The third point I want to make about this is about the importance and how we can actually de devise direction to facilitate regional and country-owned policy reforms. And we can have actually action plans and even cross-country uh, uh, running processes in four key areas. One of them is expanding government investment in social services. We do believe that is the one that is going to work very well. And we want to actually talk about designing reforms and innovative approaches to improve service delivery and we want to talk about committing to equity and inclusiveness and how we can address fertility and gender inclusiveness in our uh, uh, development discourse, and especially how we can actually harness the demographic dividend. For us, those are very, very important areas that are very important to, 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 to work, work on. Um, one day it works. There are nine papers that are going to be discussed here, Waziri. And those nine papers, I have listed them there because they are going to, to, to deal with several issues. The first one on life cycle, the second one on human capital and household prosperity, and the social inequalities. And I don't need to go through all of them, but you can see how they cover different aspects of what we're really going to talk about. They're very, very important for us because every case study that is going to be generated can actually have a unified theme across those papers and how we, de we develop diverse policy instruments and even policy reforms will rely on the frontier knowledge that is going to be generated from all these studies. And we are very happy about it. And we are also very happy about the, the coordinator of this project, Professor Rand Pritchett, a lot of sacrifice in terms of coordinating this. And all the, case, the, the, the frontier paper authors have seen so many, so many people, some of them we have worked together, others we are meeting, but we do know that they have really moved to the frontier in terms of providing us with this. It is going to be very, very important because we want to put it into a practical sense. After the framework papers, we want to move to the case studies, and that guidance is going to be very, very important for us. And that is where we generate a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, policy directions. If they are implemented, but we want to make sure that they will be implemented because we have national think tanks to actually work with, and that's going to be very, very important. Um, this policy uh, reflections meeting is going to bring together key stakeholders who have important roles to play in shaping the, the new research finding and also paving the way for new policy direct directions. And in some cases, it is going to point out to actually policy reforms or even institutional reforms that are required and that will help us in terms of initiating innovative practices in the areas of human capital development. For us, we are very happy. And because uh, Waziri, uh, Waziri, by the way, this is Swahili name to say minister. <laughs> Sorry, uh, the CS, we have changed the titles, but we still say minister or, C, uh, or Waziri. I'm so happy about uh, you are all here because being in the labor docket, but more importantly, on the social protection program is very, very important for us. We have a paper that is going to be published soon, uh, Bebe uh, and Eric Tobe, isn't it? And we showed that actually during the lockdown, Kenya was one of the countries in the African region that developed a social protection, a targeted social protection scheme. And combined with the lockdown, it's actually eased the spread of COVID-19. In fact, we compare Kenya with uh, Switzerland, isn't it? And we realized that we did very well. It, it helped to, uh, to, 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 to support the, 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 the lowering and declining of the spread of the COVID. So for us, it is very, very important. And it also joins up with uh, another study that is also coming towards the end, 
German Mwabu can talk about it until cows come home, on growth, poverty, inequality, and redistribution in Africa. And the conclusion in that study, which we, 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 we are very happy about, is that strong growth can actually significantly reduce poverty. And if you combine that with targeted social protection programs, it can threaten inequality in the long run. And for us, that's a very important thing now. We are thinking about post-COVID economic recovery because then it means that we do not want to talk about pro-poor growth strategy, but we want to talk about pro-growth poverty reduction strategy. And that becomes very, very important. It becomes a new thinking. It, it provides a new thinking. And when we combine with now human capital development, we have so many policy inroads that can help support African economies in this. So let me con co conclude here and say, let me thank uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and specifically Dan Peters for his effort and even the, the, the strength he has pushed this project to this end. We are very happy about the support. We are also very happy about the guidance. We are also happy about the coordinator of this project who has really moved together with the framework paper authors to this level. But there are so many stakeholders in this room. They are all waiting for the knowledge base. And of course, as we discuss what has come out from the studies, and we were also welcome, we were very happily welcome the discussions that will take place in terms of filling the gaps and also looking at the critical policy issues that can be picked out in country case studies and can be elaborated in terms of how we can actually ignite reforms. So thank you for that. And uh, obviously, you can't live without uh, also, oh God, uh, without saying the East African way, Asante Sana. But before I leave, let me take this uh, opportunity uh, to humbly welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Labor and the Social Protection in Kenya, and I'm sure he's going to give us some insights and even appreciate the kind of work we are doing, and he will start ready. When we come to the actual dissemination, he'll be there and he'll be counted in terms of what we're going to do. Thank you very much and welcome, Buenos Aires, and good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Njugunandungu, our former governor of our central bank, and now executive director, AERC. Uh, Mr. Abebe Shim Shimles, director of research, AERC. Dr. Caroline Wanjiru Karioki. Education Secretary, State Department of Post Training and Skills Development. Professor Teseu Waldehana, President Addis Ababa University. Professor Nicol Nicolas Meda, Executive Director, Innovation Center for Human Development, Burkina Faso. Alexandra Posarak, former lead economist, World Bank. Muna Meki, Practice Manager, Education Global Practice. Human Capital Development Practitioners, Human Capital Development Researchers, Development Partners, the For the State, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jambo. Very good. I can see your good students. We've learned a few Swahili. Uh, Professor Ndungu, I must say, I feel a bit intimidated by the presence of so many professors, and I think it's my first time to address such a distinguished, uh, highly educated people. Uh, I have aspired to be a professor. I am no, I'm on, I'm on the road, and I want to believe I will attempt as I journey towards being a professor. But more than that, I must say I'm very happy to be, to speak and stand before you uh, following a request by Professor Njugunandu, who is a distinguished economist in Kenya, having led our central bank and opened so many opportunities, anchoring digital penetration in our country, more so our celebrated M-Pesa. 
which now moved banking to every village. I can speak to my mother today. I can send money to her if she has any emergency. I do not have to send a vehicle to pick her or take money from a ta near our neighboring town to her. I can just send the money. And it's through that system that as Minister for Social Protection, the vulnerable members, the 1.1 million members, vulnerable members of our society receive, are able to now receive money on their phones as opposed to traversing kilometers uh, to pick and receive this money. This has reduced the exposure and made it easy. And it's for that reason that I gladly, on short notice, accepted to stand before you today. So it is a great honor and privilege for me to address this gathering that has brought together experts in human capital development across Africa and beyond, whose theme is human capital development in Africa. I note that the aim of this meeting is to engage in policy reflections and review the challenges of human capital development in Africa. This has come at an opportune time when all our efforts are geared towards ensuring our people can fully realize their potential as productive members of the society and hence synchronize our efforts towards building productive, prosperous, and dynamic society. I've just come back from a, a East African Community Conference, which was held for a week in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, East Africa is grouping seven countries of East Africa and is the most progressive community. And our engagement uh, centered on breaking walls, boundaries, looking at uh, other existing markets like European Union and the NAFTA, the Asian development, and even the SADAC and the ECOWAS. We looked at those economies, those communities, those markets, and felt for, one, for the first time that for, we can move machinery, we can move financial services, but we cannot succeed without harmonizing and, and uh, leveraging on the competitive, comparative skills available in all the seven countries. We realized as East African community under the leadership of our various presidents that human capital is the way to go and is the best factor of production. And I am happy to report to you that we managed to promote or to elevate labor and human capital development as a, as a, as a social, as a, as a pillar of the East African community. It has been now elevated to a sectoral uh, level, which now will be sitting, will have a standing committee, will be reflecting, will be looking at the skills available in each country. It will be looking at the gaps in each country. We have mining in Tanzania, we have mining in DRC, we have mining in Uganda. We have experts of min miners in those countries. The rest of the countries are beginning to discover oil and other minerals. We need mining experts. So to develop this region, we need that capital. We need that leverage. We need to uh, share that resource. And that will propel East Africa faster than before. So let me start by thanking the African Economic Research Consortium for organizing this meeting and for their continued research towards supporting evidence-based policy issues and economic development in the continent, a job which the consortium has done since 1963. The training and mentoring over 4,300 research economists from over 35 countries. For any economy to develop, it must have a pool of people who possess critical skills and knowledge. And um, at this point, we looked in Arusha. This is 2022. This is three years after COVID visited the world. In 1948 is three years after 
the outbreak of the World War. After, 19, after the World War, things changed in the world. Economies changed. Those who were prepared, like Germany, who used to commute from Russia to Germany, reorganized themselves and dusted themselves, rose up, pulled up their socks, and reshaped and reset the economy of Germany. Today, Germany is the big, biggest economy in Europe. So 2022 is three years after COVID, a similar catastrophe, a similar disaster. It is time for us in Africa to reset our approach to issues. We have to invest in human capital development. That is the distinguishing focus that will separate us from the rest. So, without these skills and knowledge, physical capital remains underutilized, resulting to a necessary western fall of in quality production, increased cost of production, and eventually collapse of production entities. This is why addressing human capital development must be at the forefront of any government agenda. In Kenya, over the years, there has been complaints of employers that higher education system has been creating job seekers as opposed to job creators. And the most, gra and most graduate lack skills and relevant body of knowledge required for the workplaces. And that's why you find many graduates leaving university today and they, go, they do some uh, what we call um, bridging courses. They have 10 bridging certificates in one degree because the degree they get does not uh, relate with the job and skills required. So you would find somebody went to university, got a degree in something, but for him to perform, for him to be, to be a good lawyer, they go to Kenya School of Law in, and they have a degree in law, but they have to do a diploma a technical certificate. A fellow goes to university, gets a degree in agricultural uh, engineering, but still has to go to NITA or other tertiary institution for practical knowledge. So there is a missing link in all this, and it's important that those who are involved in research, those who are involved in career development, connect and bridge the, the gaps between the workplace need, job skills required, and also what we train in our university. In fact, in Kenya, there was a grace uh, uh, about 10 years ago. All polytechnics were converted to universities. All diploma certificates, everybody wanted a degree. All our advertisement for jobs, the adverts always uh, indicate this is the job description and the, for eligibility, uh, number one, a degree. And then at the, below it, 15 years, 15 years, one five of experience. And if possible, a diploma will be an added advantage. So already the, the, the fellow, the employer is already aware that yes, you could have a degree, but without these 15 years, that degree is just a paper. Without a diploma, additional advantage of a diploma, you are still not adequate enough for that job. So that is what the, that is what the society, that is a reflection of the reality on the ground. So to try to address this concern, the government of Kenya through a whole government approach has put in place various legal institutions and policy frameworks to ensure improvement of human capital development in our country. These efforts are in line with the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the Kenya Vision 2030, and the Medium Term Plan, the African Union Agenda 2063, and the Sustainable Development Goals, of which all underpin the importance of developing human capital development. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm informed that the human capital 
is one of the ongoing collaborative research projects implemented by AERC through a generous financial support of, finan of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that this project is designed to generate new and compelling evidence and that this pro on the challenges of building human capital for accelerated inclusive development and address constraints on human capital accumulation, such as weak public financial management and service delivery systems. I'm also informed that this project is designed in successful, successive phases, where the first phase focuses on generating frontier knowledge on human capital development in Africa through framework papers, which Professor has told us, drill down into individual country of experience through a country case study whose aim is to unlock the potential human capital using local knowledge and recognizing the country context. Finally, the project envisages a close engagement with the policy community to ensure synergies between research and policy so that strategies, policies, and programs implemented in Africa countries are informed by solid evidence and replicable best practices. I'm happy to note that today various research papers authored by world-leading experts focusing on challenges and constraints faced in promoting human capital development for prosperous and inclusive Africa will form part of today's engagement as a research meets practice and policy for further reflection. And Professor, I would want to sit, maybe they are going to spend a short time to listen, I would want to also uh, learn a few things from those research papers. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that Kenya population has been grow growing rapidly with a youth of, of 15 to 34 years accounting for 36 percent of the total population. I see a number of people from Europe here. I was there a few weeks, a few months ago, and I can see the average working age is, be, is above 60 years. I think we can position Africa because we have a youthful, energetic, enthusiastic population that we can project for the next 10, 20 years. So the next scramble of the world should be in Africa. This large youth cohort can offer demographic dividend if only if the rate of growth of the economy is high, inclusive, and sustainable. And it can only be sustainable through continuous skill development. Allow me to highlight some of the government interventions geared towards human capital development in our country, Kenya. On the health sector, the government of Kenya has made strides in promoting and improving health status of all Kenyans through deliberate restructuring of the health sector to make health services more effective, accessible, and affordable. One of the ongoing health care reforms include implementation of universal health coverage to ensure all Kenyans have access to health services. This is a very emotive issue now in Kenya, and I think tomorrow there will be a presidential debate and some of the issues that will, be, will come out and will be subject of discussion and, and in engagement will be on the health sector. And uh, given uh, going forward, we believe through this engagement we'll be able to position health as a priority in this country. We are one of the ongoing health reforms include implementation of universal health coverage to ensure all Kenyans have access to health service. Other milestones include health sector, increased coverage of the National Health Insurance Fund, implementation of Linda Mama program offering free maternity services, investment in the health infrastructure which has witnessed for the 3% increase in public health services, recruitment of additional 15,354 healthcare workers increased community health coverage from 10% in 2013 to 91% and establishment of the Kenya National Health Public Health Institute to coordinate public health and functions across all sectors. In addition, <clears throat> in 
In 2013, the health sector was devolved to ensure effective health service delivery across all our 47 counties. On education sector, the government of Kenya has greatly increased its budgetary allocation to ensure all children have access to education with the transition rate from primary to secondary at over 90%. The government is currently working to ensure there is high completion rate and also to improve the quality of learning through introduction of competence-based curriculum. On skills development, the Kenya Vision 2030 goal for labor and employment sector is to create a globally competitive and adaptive human resource based that can meet the demand of rapidly industrializing economy. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore the future of work. We are now witnessing increased trends in remote or flexi working, e-commerce, automation, and also emergence of new skills and occupation. This now calls on us to quickly change our skills and development strategies so that we can build a resilient, adoptive, and competitive workforce. The strategies such as redeployment, reskilling, and upskilling will be vital in ensuring the country has the right people possessing the required capabilities in the right roles at the right time. To achieve this, we must ensure that we provide timely, reliable, and up-to-date labor market information, embrace labor productivity improvement, and establish strong linkages between training institutions, industry, and stakeholders in the labor market. And I think, Professor, this is it. The linkage between the job market and the training institution is a missing link. And efforts, as you do research and carry out your studies, this is where the problem is. We have been training basing on uh, before independence uh, curriculum. We are teaching our students uh, about who discovered Lake Victoria, who, dis who the first man to see Lake Rudolph was called Mr. Rudolph, and we tested them on that. The first man to see River Nile and matches on Falls. I mean, that is, okay, you can test the memory of the student, but cannot be a whole year study to know who discovered Lake Turkana and who discovered Lake Victoria. It is important that we re reset our curriculum to take into consideration the new emerging world order, more so after COVID. And if we organize ourselves three years after COVID, we could be the best, we could be better, we could be the, the new frontier in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So this now calls for quickly to change our skill strategy. And to achieve this, we must ensure we provide timely and up-to-date job market information. My ministry, through the National Industrial Training Authority, is implementing skilling, reskilling, and upskilling programs in addition to implementation of recognition of prior learning. This is a, a popular program that we introduced a year ago, which even uh, the president did pronounce. After briefing him, he made a national pronouncement to recognize any form of talent and skill and certify them after assessment. This has given those who did not, for any reason, finish their coursework or did not have any formal education to have uh, recognition. And from there on, we keep on upskilling them, particularly those who have expert uh, artisan or uh, prior knowledge on any trait, like painting, like uh, um, uh, sewing, like uh, plumbing, like these manual jobs. This way, we could be able to improve our delivery, our quality of service. 
we have very many graduates on engi civil engineering. But if you told one engineer to fix and assemble these ro stones and come up with this structure, they may draw, they may design, but they may not put together the paint, the cement, and ballast, and stones, and come up with a structure like this. It is those technical fellows that now deliver the service, deliver the products. So, NITA has established a sector on training committees to advise on the training by incorporating industry players in designing of curriculum for various industry sectors. In addition, since skill certification is crucial to workers because it provides opportunities for upward mobility, the result of acceptance by employers acquired and cert certified competencies, establishment of the Kenya National Qualification Framework has come in the right time to facilitate vertical and horizontal progression across our sub frameworks the basic education, the tertiary and vocational education uh, institutions, skills, and the university education with lifelong learning being the underpinning concept. The other important consideration in human development is the strategies towards promotion of employment. According to 2022 economic survey, Last year, our economy created 926,100 jobs. However, 83% of these jobs were in the informal sector. This has seen the trend in the last, this has been our trend in the last uh, survey in our country. In an effort to address the challenge of youth unemployment, our government established National Employment Authority to provide services such as registration and placement of job seekers in employment, both locally and abroad. Offer career guidance and counseling, collection of data on job seekers, and to improve access their service, NEA has now automated its employment services. Even as government doubles its efforts to ensure that there are enough TVET institutions countrywide, a, and a considerable proportion of the youth in Kenya are still not in employment, education, or training. These youths are particularly at risk because they are neither improving their future employability through investment in vital skills nor gaining workplace experience through employment. These youth therefore face the real danger of being shut out of the labor market and excluded in the society and are likely to be caught in poverty trap, making them more vulnerable. The other key concept of human development is investment in social protection. Our social protection sector is widely categorized into social assistance, social security, social insurance, and occupational safety and health at workplaces. In our country, social assistance are non-contributory transfer in cash vouchers or in kind to individuals or households in need, public works programs, fees waivers for basic health and education services, and subsidies while social security and health insurance are contributory schemes providing compensatory support in the event of con contingencies such as old age, invalidity, and illness respectively. Similarly, our social assistance through its budgetary allocation by the government, including cash transfers to orphans and vulnerable children, older persons aged over 70 years and above, persons with severe disability and hunger safety net program covering the poor and vulnerable in arid and semi-arid lands. Social security through the National Social Security Van Fund and other public and private based occupational pension schemes while the health insurance is implemented through National Hospital Insurance Fund and individual occupational-oriented medical insurance schemes, one of the key mandates of my ministry is promotion and maintenance of safety and health in workplaces, which is important in improving workplace productivity, competitiveness, and longevity. My ministry, through the Directorate of Occupational Safety and Health Workplace, is working on establishing an all-inclusive social-based work injury insurance scheme to ensure that workers in the country will have access to comprehensive benefits 
on compensation of injury or accidents at workplace. Another is aspect of human capital development, which is central to my ministry, is labor migration. Over the years, Kenya has continued to experience migration of its citizens to different parts of the world, with bulk of those seeking opportunities being the youth. We have over 4 million Kenyans, almost 10% of our population abroad. And we have embraced labor migration because of its labor immense socioeconomic benefits to both countries of origin and destination. Labor migration is a source of employment and livelihood for migrant workers, bridges skills gaps in destination countries, supports skills development and technological transfer in the countries of origin, and also the source of much needed remittance in the migrant workers countries of origin. To put it in perspective, uh, migrant, uh, migrant workers abroad remitted 430 billion Kenya shillings or, or 3.7 billion US dollars last year as of December. This is a report from Central Bank of Kenya. And this has grown <clears throat> from 104.6 billion million US dollars in 2004. Several, these are, <clears throat> this has overtaken our traditional exports of coffee, tea, and tourism. That means with the proper investment in human capital development, we can, we can raise, we are now number four in Africa after Nigeria, uh, Ghana, and I think more Egypt. We are number four in terms of remittance receipt from export of labor. Several studies have confirmed that families that receive migrant remittance access better health services, have better education, high financial access, and low poverty levels. Moreover, remittance flows through formal channels, provide opportunities for encouraging savings, increasing deposits, and deepening financial inclusion and development. In recognition of the importance of my labor migration, the government through my ministry has instituted reforms in the labor migration management. These include, but not limited to, final, finalized development of national policy on labor migration and labor migration management bill, review the regulation on private employment agencies, signed four bilateral labor agreements with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the state of Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and recently United Kingdom. Uh, last year, September, we visited with our president to uh, United Kingdom and signed a bilateral agreement to transfer 20,000 health workers, specifically nurses, to United Kingdom for, the net for six years. In addition, my ministry is currently negotiating additional seven PLAs with key labor destination countries and have introduced mandatory pre-departure training and orientation for all migrating workers and strengthening availability and quality of labor migration data to inform evidence-based and gender-sensitive policies and dialogues around labor migration governance. These countries include Canada, America, they include uh, Italy and Germany, and we have also engaged with Poland. My ministry through the labor attaches is also conducting regular assessments of skills demand in labor and foreign market to increase job opportunities. And the government has also put in a lot of investment in infrastructure development, such as rail and road construction. So to improve, so as I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, Despite the tremendous efforts by the government, the government has put in place, the country still has a long way to go to fully developing its human capital. As of 2017, Kenya Human Capital Index, HCI, was 59.5%, translating to human capital development GAF of 40.5 percent. This implies that a child born in Kenya will only be 59.5 percent productive 
as they could be as a future worker if they enjoyed complete education and health. To improve our capital, human capital development, it is imperative that skills development institutions learn how to respond to market signals and design programs that respond to industry and society needs. These changes will allow institutions of higher learning in Kenya to allocate their scarce resources to what is needed in economy in contrast what is mistakenly considered a reflect economic growth. I hope that today's deliberations and findings from the various research papers will support in better understanding the gaps and areas of improvement in human capital development and more importantly in our country. I know we have uh, a number of universities, I think over 40 now in Kenya, which are accredited and uh, licensed by Commission of University Education. And uh, <clears throat> majority of them are going through serious financial challenges, which undermines their capacity to offer the right skills and human resource development. And this is one area that while we, at, uh, as, uh, while, while we endeavor and work hard to provide the right skills, the institutions also must be sustainable, must be able to re uh, remain afloat to offer these skills, to train our people. So it's something that equally requires consideration. You know, we've tried to balance between module two and uh, which we normally popu popu popularly known as parallel program and the module one to support the universities. But I think that is something that needs a lot. And then we have a lot of duplication in Kenya. Some institutions training the same things, another institution training on the same things. There is need to harmonize so that we have special specialization by specific universities. So with those many remarks, I want to thank you for listening to me and also getting the highlights of how we have handled and focused on human capital development. I want to thank you and uh, wish you a good deliberation and I want to take this opportunity to declare this uh, deliberation officially open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, uh, for this uh, uh, inspiring, informative, and quite encouraging uh, remarks. Um, so we now moving on. Uh, let me invite Dan Peters uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to say a few words uh, about uh, this project and why they are involved. Uh, and also, he's been steering this project with us for the last three years, so it's really appropriate to hear from him uh, what he feels has been the progress so far uh, and the future for this. Please, Dan. Thanks, Abebe. Um, and if the minister was intimidated to speak, then I feel uh, doubly, maybe triply intimidated uh, coming after his uh, speech, uh, Professor Ndungu, and coming before uh, Lant. Um, so maybe just a couple of comments. First of all, the foundation is honored to be able to support the work uh, under this project. I think it's been exciting uh, over the last three years to see uh, the engagements between our framework researchers who are here today, uh, also working with uh, think tanks in seven countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and then also connected with institutions uh, like the Global, uh, like the World Bank, that's represented here today. That we're also supporting uh, work on human capital at that institution. So seeing all of these come together has been, uh, I think, uh, quite quite noteworthy. Um, today, though, I think we're excited to hear um, from our framework. Uh, paper authors to hear further deliberations on some of the 
questions that the minister just raised. Um, and so I want to I be brief here, but I was uh, you know, just rereading Lance's uh, life cycle framework approach paper on the 13-hour uh, flight from Dulles to Addis Ababa yesterday. And there are just a couple of things that, that I thought were interesting and, and noteworthy to think about as, as we continue deliberations today. The first of those was, uh, Lane quite ably puts in the paper that investing in, in human capital doesn't mean spending on school or frankly from the foundation's perspective, spending on health or other aspects of, of human capital. And I think this is even more true now as we are coming out of COVID and as many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are being hit by an economic crisis because of Ukraine, about uh, economic developments in advanced economies. It's important that we're thinking about how we're spending uh, existing resources wisely um, on the formation of human capital. Um, we have reduced fiscal buffers in many, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We see rapidly rising debt ratios. Uh, and so the wise use of those resources, um, I think is, is something that we should focus on today. In addition, I think, unfortunately, Many donors uh, seem to be pulling back in terms of the additional assistance that they might be providing because of their own fiscal fiscal uh, space issues. So I think that's that's one important uh, topic to focus on. I think another thing that struck me in Lance's paper was thinking about human capital um, and what's distinctly African about the patterns of human capital formation and utilization, um, different from what we might think about in you know, the United States, in North America, in, you know, other parts of, of the world. What, what are the specific issues that we're confronting uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa? And I think one of the things, actually, that the minister just mentioned at the end of his speech um, that I think is a challenge but also an enormous opportunity is uh, the demographic uh, trends that we see in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, has the advantage of an enormous youth population, whereas the rest of the world at this point, frankly, is facing large aging populations um, and, and how we deal with that, that demographic trend. So I think thinking about I think, uh, the last thing that I'd mention that both Lant touches on in his paper, but that the minister also mentioned is thinking about not just the formation of human capital, but also how it's utilized once uh, that formation has taken place. And uh, I think that the foundation, as with many other donors, traditionally has probably been very guilty of thinking about the formation of human capital, how we're investing um, in children, and not thinking about the important linkages then about how that is used uh, once uh, people graduate but need to get 10 bridging degrees to, to go along with, with, their, uh, with their university degree. And so thinking about how human capital plays out um, in the labor market, how it helps to address some of the youth employment challenges that the minister referred to, I think is another uh, incredibly important area for research and discussion. Um, so with that, again, the foundation is very uh, pleased to be able to support this project. And I know I'm looking forward to the discussions uh, today and then also uh, the work with the uh, master class over the next three days as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, so we are almost ready now for the big event, uh, or what we call is the main event. Uh, probably uh, we would like to take uh, group picture with the Honorable Minister. So everybody will go home and say, okay, today I was rubbing shoulders with powerful people. So just take a couple of minutes, uh, second floor terrace, and then we come back and start. So let's not waste much time. Let's go as a group. Uh, and uh, it's second floor, just upstairs. Uh, is that right, Cecilia? You can take us. Uh, where is Cecilia? Yeah, second floor, yes. Okay, so let's quickly go and come back.
various research into improving education systems. And so partly what I'm saying today is a reflection on our frameworks for human capital. Part of it is a reflection of this larger eight-year project that's coming to a culmination. Um, and I think there's, um, and I noticed that we've all been provided with this very handy thing to take our notes on in case you didn't bring your own paper, in case you still use paper, which no one actually does. But I noticed that here on the front of it, it has the date and the day. And then right here in red is this little blank slot labeled in red, big idea. <laughs> Which I think is very helpful and hopeful that you have come away for this from some big idea. And I think if the one big idea you came away from what the 10 minutes or less I'm going to say is invest isn't spend. We have all, <laughs> one of the ways politics works very different from academia is politics is often a process of constructive ambiguity. We'll all use a word that we can all agree on by using it in very different ways. And so there's a huge consensus that we should invest in human capital that, and the consensus hinges on never being precise about what we mean by invest. So half of people who say invest in human capital mean spend more. That's all they mean is spend more. Whereas when I use the word invest in human capital, I believe that unless it's been effective at advancing the objective, it wasn't investment. Investment isn't spend. Um, and I have anyway a variety of ways of talking about that. But so I want to. Around that theme, I want to sort of just make three points. <laughs> First, learning performance in basic education around the world, but even more particularly some, to some extent in Africa, is bad. And it's still getting worse. That's really important. <laughs> because if it's still getting worse, business as usual can't save you. If business as usual has led to where we are, more of business as usual is going to lead to more of where we are. There's no other way to think about that, which leads to the second point, which is a huge social, political, and organizational commitments are needed at all levels to accelerate progress. And at all levels, I mean from the school to the district to the country to the region, at all levels. And these are huge recommitments to the to the idea and goals of basic education um, and and I want to <laughs> I want to e emphasize that this is not a technocratic fix this is not a ministry issue a minister of education it is embedded in a much larger set of historical social political forces and unless those forces are running with the ministry the ministry can't fix the problems that we have and last, human capital depends on productive utilization. The human capital problem is the economic and growth social transformation problem and vice versa. Until there are um, ways. So let me, let me go through the first, these just three things. And I just have a couple of, the reason I'm using slides is I just have a couple of images or, <laughs> um, and this is a very recent piece of research that's not actually totally in the public domain yet, but it uses the demographic and health survey data to go back and ask for a person and uh, who was educated in a given year, what's the likelihood if they got five years of schooling, they could as an adult read a sentence. So this is interviewing adults, asking them to read a simple single sentence in whatever language they choose. So this is not English. This is not deep literacy. This is just can you read. And what you see in sub-Saharan Africa is the probability that a person with five years of education could read a sentence has gone down over the last 50 years in a very, and in a very steady and disappointing way. So the trend, if it's continued, is not that things are getting better. And let me show a, a, a much... Uh, this is our PR version. I'll show you our more technical uh, academic version. 
meaning what I kind of like to do. This is tracing out the relationship between the, the percent that can read a sentence on the vertical axis and the extent to which the system expanded on the horizontal axis. So on the horizontal axis is the increase in the proportion that completed grade five or higher. So that was the expansion of the system. But on the vertical axis, it's the, the, again, the likelihood that a person who, as an adult, who got five years of education can read. And what you see is these countries highlighted in red, and I'm gonna pick on Zambia um, for no good reason, um, other than it's not Kenya, so I'm not gonna <laughs> excite any local, <laughs> any local hostility. Um, you can see that uh, in a person who was born in 1954, and hence would have been started their education in 1960, um, they had a greater than 60% chance of being able to read as an adult. That's fallen to almost only 20% for children who, <laughs> for adults who uh, were born in 1998. So this is what business as usual is going to continue. And, uh, <laughs> and there are actually not that many countries that have avoided this trend. So the general trend has been massive. The, the black line is kind of averaged over all these 50 or so countries for which we have data. The average is lots more kids went to school. The likelihood you learned to read, well, yeah, I didn't do anything. The <laughs> I was using Zambia for that reason, so they wouldn't shut it off. Um, the, the likelihood that you learned to read while in school went way down. Now. I can say that the key important point of that is just to motivate that business as usual is what produced this. So a continuation of business as usual, you can have no other reasonable expectation other than it will continue the current trends, right? Um, and uh, I'm gonna skip that because it's even more controversial. Um, I'm gonna to get to th this, which is controversial enough. Part of this is that we, we aren't yet adequately prioritizing learning because this is a study where they interviewed people engaged in, um, uh, policymakers engaged in a variety of human capital-like endeavors. <laughs> the, green, the sort of vertical axis is what they thought kids in their country were actually learning. So there's just a radical disconnect of reality for policymakers. Policymakers think things are going in school radically better than they actually are. So <laughs> you can imagine the, oh, with that level of overestimation of what kids are actually doing in school, you could be relatively complacent about what needs to change. You could believe it, you know, if you really believed that 80% of kids were learning, um, you could be relatively complacent about just continuation of business as usual. But you have all kinds of people who believe that 60 or 80% of kids are learning in countries where only 20% of kids actually are. So <laughs> we have yet to turn the corner on the internalization and that's what um, will require the last two points I wanna make, which is B, this is a huge thing that has to happen. You don't fix problems of this magnitude in narrow technocratic ways as long as people are radically overestimating what's actually going on in terms of how well it's doing and in ter until people understand that business as usual is a downward trend. Until we in fully internalize and incorporate those things, the invest in human capital is gonna continue to be the constructive ambiguity of spend on human capital and it will likely reproduce the, in some sense, <laughs> our problem with education is not that people aren't doing anything, but it's the complacency of busy busyness. People are very busy doing lots of things. It isn't that people aren't doing things about human capital. They are very busy about it. But the question is, are they busy yet about the right things with the right urgency? That's the big question. Then the, 
last kind of, and I don't have any additional slides, the last point I want to make is this integration around the framework papers. We have a variety of different things we have for these nine framework papers. But I think we need to also reintegrate <coughs> this important point that the minister was raising about the jointness of what are the skill sets youth have and what are the skill sets that the dynamism of the economy are generating. And that mismatch of kids kind of receiving rote learning formal training that is m preparing <laughs> uh, for um, jobs that don't exist uh, is, is a real serious problem that needs to be tackled. So the, the economic growth problem is the structural transformation and productivity problem, is the human capital problem, and the human capital problem is the transformation problem. The, the education system, uh, and just at a recent conference in Oxford, a part of our larger project, we had a woman who'd done a research on why um, parents in northern Nigeria were sending their kids to the Islamic schools as opposed to the private schools. And the basic response of the parents was very sensible. They say, our children are not being prepared for jobs that don't exist, and in the meantime are being taught to disrespect us. So, so they're being taught to disrespect what was uniquely the heritage that the parents wanted to pass on through a kind of vague, secularized, nationalized, disembodied, technocratic education. But they weren't really getting that. <laughs> so they were getting the bad attitude about disrespecting their elders without actually incorporating the skills they needed. And then in these villages in northern Nigeria, there weren't any formal sector jobs to be trained for anyway. Um, so that integration of <laughs> what's the actual social economic transformation for which the education is deeply and historically and socially embedded that will produce the joint transformation that's the key thing that's going to require the recommitment to education. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lance. So, so uh, Professor Moabu, now uh, is your time. Please come. Thank you. Uh, so I have to remove, have to remove this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director of Research. Um, I will actually stand here so that uh, I'm not hindered by this uh, instrument. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, two things. Uh, the first one is for me to conceptualize, following the literature of human capital, what human capital is. And then I talk about uh, the value of that conceptualization uh, in terms of policy. So uh, human capital is uh, a force in people that we cannot see. It's not observable, but it has concrete economic and social consequences that we can actually relate to, like what the minister explained, that we can now send money directly to the villages when before we could not do that. That comes from what human capital can do. This force, which is in people, but which we don't see, this idea of um, a force in people, which is not observable, is from um, Robert Lucas in his paper of 1988, where he talked about the mechanics of development. And by mechanics of development, he was thinking about uh, the processes through which an economy uh, goes to move from low incomes to high incomes, and thereby provide good standard of living for the population. 
That's what he was talking about. And he concluded that the force behind that, that transformation that uh, Professor Lant Richard has talked about, is actually human capital. But um, if we have to invest in this human capital in a sensible way, as we have been told by the Gates Foundation and also by Professor Lant Pritchett, we need to actually be able to measure this uh, an, an, an observable force in people so that we know how much to invest in it. So now, this is a, this is a, a tricky issue, but uh, following the literature, I can assume, I, I now, I assume that this force can be divided into five parts, just randomly divided. One part is called, or I call it, education. And this can be measured by years of schooling. I've actually learned, learned Richard's uh, paper very well. So I'm using schooling there with a question mark. And the great value of the paper actually is not the many list of the things you can invest in, but it actually makes the reader think very hard. Okay, so I did some of that, some of that following uh, his paper. So education, measured that way. Then the other component, of human capital is health. And health here can be measured by um, uh, life expectancy at, at birth. This has also been mentioned. Or the number of days of uh, good health. The third component of human capital, assumed now, is nutrition. And this can be measured by height, by weight, and also combine, comparing the two to get the uh, body mass index. And this body mass index is um, the number of KNGs that um, are supported by a square inch of foot or feet or, or, or meter. Uh, now, the fourth component of human capital is ability to control fertility, ability to control fertility. And this ab ability is also not observable, but it depends on our knowledge of, our, of how our bodies function. The fifth component, also actually mentioned especially by the minister, is labor mobility. And this, as he explained very well, um, um, is can be measured using migration. Or basically moving from one's home to find a job outside the home or to work outside the home. Okay. So 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 those are the five main components of the literature uh, of, of human capital as you find it in the literature. Education, health, nutrition, ability to control fertility, and labor mobility. Now one major characteristic of this human capital now, you see now, I moved from the force we cannot see to some proxies for that force, proxied by these five, uh, or five components, which are actually the basis for what we are going to invest in. So the one uh, characteristic of, of this human capital is that it cannot be bought from the market. We can't buy it. You can only produce it. Very few concrete examples. Height. I cannot buy an inch from the minister and claim now that is my inch. There's no way to do it. Okay? I have to produce that one from Chandu. Actually, from the time I was in my, from the time we, we, we were in our mom's wombs. A combination of luck, a combination of nutrition, and so on. But we can't buy it from the market. If we want to, that's, and this is one point that Professor Richard is making about the business as, as usual. Another example is um, ability to do mathematics. The owner can, can, can do these uh, theorems. I cannot buy that ability from him. 
I actually to I actually to produce it myself. Okay. So the basic point is, think the best point is uh, human capital is not something we can buy in the market, but some of the inputs that go into into its production we can actually buy. All right. So so that's the basic uh, the basic point point there, and um, actually from there, as you can see, th this framework leads to a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> points to us, the kind of things that we can do to increase this human capital. Now, I, I'll, go, I'll just uh, mention a few. One of them, thing we can invest in, a school. Now, I know now I'm on a very slippery ground because of what we have been showing. Is actually is not producing what we want, but the school still remains a very convenient mechanism for gathering the children together and actually giving them these skills that they need. So I think for me, what I get from uh, the framework paper by uh, Professor Pritchett is um, that we need to reform the school and the curriculum. But I don't think it's telling us to throw away the school. Okay, that's my first point about the school. So we invest in more schools so that we can reach the children who are not, in, who are very far from the schools. Because if a child is 10 kilometers from the school, that child will not learn. Okay? And if that child comes to the school and the school is not teaching well, the child will also not learn. So we need both quantity and quality, and invest. Okay, uh, invest in both. Okay, based on the correct information about uh, uh, these production functions. Actually, those people who have uh, read a uh, recent paper, he also he also says end stop. The, now I'm on the academic side, and this naive. Um, education production functions. Actually, when I, I learned that sentence, I kind of got uh, uh, worried. I thought, oh, but this is the only two that we have to measure things. But I think the naive part is what we should emphasize. Okay, so we need actually to have an informed view of how education is produced so that we can, we don't waste our resources in school investments which are not giving us uh, what we need. And um, now the, the other thing I, I should mention is, uh, and, and I should have done this earlier. So human capital gives us wealth. The good things that we see, this and so on, the, t the phones, the technology, the industries, human Wealth also gives us human capital. So actually, it's a big mistake, okay, to just look at the link, okay, moving from uh, moving from uh, human capital wealth with the other part, the link coming from wealth to human capital. So I talked about a paper by Robert Lucas, actually. The other paper related to this literature, where you need to combine these two ideas. The idea where we're getting good things, wealth, from human capital. There's another idea which tells us we also get human capital from wealth. It's a, it's a paper actually by the coordinator of this project with, with the Samas, uh, Richard, which is, at, which is entitled um, uh, Wealthier is Healthier. If you have wealth, and we invest it well, then you are actually going to accumulate a lot of human capital. But if you don't, if you don't invest it well, you are accumulating no human capital at all. Okay. So, so, so in building human capital in uh, in Africa, we actually need to take these two ideas into account and use it to generate uh, um, uh, the evidence. And this is what the ERC calls bringing rigor and the evidence to policy making. So actually, what I, I want to end by saying that uh, 
this simple conceptualization of uh, uh, human capital as a force in people, which has this uh, almost miraculous things we see, okay, um, is the basis for the things, for the policies that the minister is actually implementing. So these policies have actually a concrete conceptual basis, but we need now to, feel, to provide evidence of where these policies are working and where they're not working so that we can actually make improvements. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, and, and, and thank you, everybody. Um, I, I also don't have slides, um, so I'll start with um, summarizing something that I think that Lant has made uh, very clear um, in his papers and a little bit in the presentation that he gave uh, this morning. So I'm, I'm borrowing very much from his uh, construction here. So African states have succeeded in building the capacity to create higher levels of human capital, but most African states do not have the capability to transform capacity at the provider level. They don't have the capability to transform the capacity of doctors, nurses, and teachers into the necessary action. Okay, so it, the capabilities, the cap, sorry, the capacity is there, but it is the difficult job of the state to transform capacity into action. And that is where we're missing something. The problem is that we as researchers and policymakers are measuring capacity. Almost everything we measure is, is there a room? Is there a chair? Is there a student sitting in a chair? Is there a chalkboard? Is there someone standing in front of the chalkboard? And those things are not actions. Those are just capacities, okay? So because we're measuring the wrong thing, a lot of the framework papers are showing very odd patterns, right? We show things like we have highly educated people, as the minister mentioned, who are not employed. Well, then the question is how do we, did we measure education properly, right? It was degrees, and as the minister pointed out, maybe the degrees are not meaning what we want them to mean. Maybe they don't have the same meaning that they should. There's an odd pattern of the link between fertility and education, right? Yes, African women need more education, that's very clear, but even the African women who are educated are making different decisions about fertility. Are we measuring education properly? FDI has a very different pattern in Sub-Saharan Africa than we've seen in other places, and it seems like they're importing human, human uh, capital when, with FDI rather than using the human capital that should be uh, present, okay? We have weak links between human capital and well-being. So all of these are suggestive of the fact that maybe we're not measuring the right thing. We've been told to measure years of education and that's not actually the correct measure in this context, all right? The irony, and, and I wanna make sure that I make this clear, what that means from a researcher perspective is it's actually very easy to design a policy relevant intervention that improves things, right? So this is, I think this is an important concept here. If there's a very weak link between the capacity to provide a service and the action and you wander in with some fancy new design and you've got the latest thing and the best technology, it's very easy to improve things. Because you motivate people, they're excited, it's new, it's interesting, and everyone wakes up. And so almost anything, and I have literally done randomized controlled trials on interventions that did nothing and shown huge success, right? We go in and we don't do anything. And people are so excited that we're there that they work harder. But we didn't do anything, right? So there's gonna be a huge flow of research showing, look how easy it is to fix everything, right? 
and all that's showing is, yeah, you fixed it, you were there for six months, you leave, and then it goes away. You hand it off to a government that has low capabilities to implement programs, and it won't think. We're measuring that. In that case, we're looking in places. That's not where the actual problem is. So why? What is going wrong? So I can speak only for myself and in capacity, in the various capacities that I can speak for. And I think one of the big problems is that the truth of the matter is the donors don't care about things except our children's sitting in the classroom. The people from the state of Maryland that I serve, the students who I teach, they love to see pictures, particularly of girls, in classrooms. If you show them a picture of a girl in a classroom, they write you a check. The old women in my church will open their pocketbooks for pictures of girls in classrooms, right? You tell them we need to invest more research in improving the productivity of cassava, everything. Ooh, they've gone to sleep. But you show them a picture of a girl in a classroom and they open their pocketbooks, right? But what we learned is that's actually, that's what Lance is telling us. That's not helping, right? But that's very exciting. So donors are very excited about that. And in my field in healthcare, it's MCH services. Anything for MCH, right? We love it. The idea of mothers being well taken care of, little children, antenatal care, everything, MCH, okay? Then the researchers, and I am a researcher, we do these policy relevant RCTs, right? And these are the things that I talked about earlier, where we show success, but it doesn't actually lead to any change, right? And it's because we're focused on policy relevance. And I'm actually going to make an argument that we should, in a minute, I'm going to make an argument that we need to get away from being driven by everything being policy relevant. Sometimes the search for knowledge is useful just by itself, okay? And then the, the third thing, and this is very clear in, in a lot of Lance writing, but he didn't put it in his presentation. Maybe he was being politically correct, and so I'm, I'm in danger here, is we're all lying, right? We know, those of us who work in Africa, and I do work in Africa, we know what the truth is on the ground, right? But not everyone wants to talk about it. Right? So we talk about things like, I just read a, a, I was just reading a nice paper where they did a very fancy, beautiful intervention in Nigeria, but then they mention in a footnote that 60% of the doctors that they had been working with had not received any salary payment within the last six months, and some of them it had been over a year since they had received any salary. What are we doing with some fancy intervention designed, you know, in Oxford or one of the Cambridges or something like that when the people have not been paid, right? How, uh, pay them first, right? I had a project in, in Liberia that I just finished up and we did a very expensive World Bank implemented randomized controlled trial on performance-based financing. And I'm just now discovering as I'm writing up the report that during that time period, the government cut the salaries of the health workers I was studying in half. Of course, my project was destroyed by the fact that the health workers' salaries were cut in half, except the ones that we gave the PBF to, like they got some money back, so they were happy. But what, we're lying when we write all these fancy papers and everything, when that's what's really happening on the ground. Eight of the 10 heads of hospitals that I interviewed, I could just call them on WhatsApp. This is, I love this, right? <laughs> Their number one problem in running a hospital in rural Liberia, no electricity. Because someone is not telling the truth if the fact is that hospitals are being run without electricity, right? In a country like Liberia, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, and then, and I was talking with Germano about this, and I think this is very important. If you spend time, and this isn't, I speak for healthcare, but I think the same thing could be true in education. You spend time going to talk to the actual practitioners. These are people who really want to do the right thing. They are trained. They don't know everything, but they know a lot. And they want to do the right thing, but their jobs are extremely difficult, right? It is very difficult to work in a rural area and be told, maybe your salary will come in a year, maybe we will cut in half, maybe it will be, maybe there will be electricity. These things are, are a big problem. So what do we as researchers need to do about this? And I want to be very careful, Minister, I'm very grateful that you're here, 
but I am criticizing researchers right now, not implementers, okay? So this is, so please don't listen to me, okay? And I, and I wanna, I, I actually am very, I mean, I'm very much a big fan of, of what Land has said and what he's been saying, but I'm gonna pretend that he made a mistake here that I know he didn't make, but I'm gonna pretend that he made a mistake. So what he told us uh, about 20 minutes ago was, progress, business as usual, is not working, right? And then he showed us a slide that said the direction that we're going in right now is the wrong direction. But he also told us we need to accelerate. Okay? No. That's not what you do. Right? You know that the car is going in the wrong direction. Right? The first thing you have to do is at least take your foot off of the accelerator. Right? And I think the question that researchers have to ask themselves is what is the brake? What does it look like? What is a brake in this context? And a brake means stop and admit that we don't yet know what we're looking at. We have not figured out how to measure what matters. And we need to stop rushing to solve the problem. And again, if you're the minister, right, you need to keep doing your job, right? Please do not hit the brakes, okay? But let us worry about, we are continuing to generate knowledge that is false because we don't yet know what we're measuring. And I think that's one of the questions that's been very informative for me in terms of reading these papers, like thinking about what does a break look like in this context? And so one of the things that I think is really important is recognizing that there are pockets of high performance out there, that you meet people who are doing excellent jobs. Maybe it's at the country level, maybe it's at the region, maybe it's at the district, maybe it's just inside one health facility or one school but we don't yet have the proper way of measuring what's happening there, so we can't find these places because we don't know what we're looking for, okay? But they're out there. So I think focusing on success, measurement and success, and then I actually, I disagree with Lant and he hasn't brought this up here, but I think randomized control trials are fantastic. I think it's the policy relevant randomized control trials that are problematic, right? You can use a randomized control trial simply to generate knowledge, right? Not to find the answer, because we don't even have the right question yet, but to just generate knowledge. And I think there are ways of doing research, and randomized control trials are not the only way, to find out what is actually happening. Another way is just talking to people. You talk to a rural practitioner, and you say, what's happening here, right? And they'll tell you a lot of things that are maybe not very helpful, but there's always a, a kernel of truth underlying that. Okay, so I think, I think what, what's, what's interesting to me is trying to figure out as researchers and as, don as the donors as well, right? Pause at the very least. At least pull the foot off of the accelerator just slightly. We're heading in the wrong direction. Let's take some time to figure out what is it that we're, sh what should we be measuring? And then once we know what we should be measuring, where can we find the pockets of success? And maybe they're not pockets. Maybe they're much bigger than that right? But we don't yet know. And can we build up from that? Because I strongly believe, and again, I was talking with Professor Mwabu about this earlier, I strongly believe that Africa is actually full of very hardworking providers, people who are determined to make sure that things can work, and they're very limited. It's not yet, they're not yet being set free in their capacity to do that. So, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so let me do a little of the bridge. Uh, we know we run over our time, so our panelists just be patient with us, but you can see the inspiration coming. So we don't want to disrupt that. Those of you who want to pick coffee, you can go and get it here. So we start with our panelists, and uh, Professor Lant Pritchett is the moderator. want coffee you can just go and get it and uh, okay the minister is leaving so Yeah, yeah. Um, what are we going to do 
you about the microphone problem. Yeah, we can, we can, uh, you can but speak from here, right? Well, I hope so, but are these mics not working? Because yeah, if these mics aren't working, then we can't just go around the room and call on people. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. They work. Yeah? They work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's working. panel is we've heard from some but not all of the framework papers some of the other authors of the framework papers are here but um, we've heard from the minister now we have a collection of individuals who we hope to hear from their own experience um, and what they see as challenges uh, of the type that a research program uh, on human capital can help with and what they see as the future um, I I don't I don't know all of these people, and yeah, so yeah. should I just go in this order? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to I've, and and uh, we are running not just moderately but radically <laughs> behind schedule in ways that were necessitated by the course of events, and so um, so if each person could take sort of five to seven minutes and just sort of say. And we're we're oh, not ex we're just expecting people to elicit and express kind of what they see from their point of view. Different people, a lot of what you see depends on where you sit. What they see is the challenges. So we'll start with Dr. Caroline Wanjuri Karayuki. Um, is she here yet, or is she okay? Oh, there she is. Okay, yes, good. I'm here. Sorry, I didn't see your name yes. tag there. This is okay. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll start with her, and then maybe. Okay. five to seven minutes and okay. then we'll go around the room and then we'll have a sort of uh, after we'll have floor intervention discussion after that so please okay thank you um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, human capital development based on the national skills development policy which we have developed uh, so far it has reached it has um, gone through several stages and uh, it's just remaining to be tabled in the cabinet for approval. Uh, so I just want to share a few issues that are key to your research because I was told that uh, you're interested in seeing where there are gaps. So in terms of access, uh, very briefly, we have noted that there is a decline in university enrollment and uh, increase in TVET enrollment. And uh, we're not very sure why this is happening but we suspect it's because there could be um, low linkage between university education and the labor market. Uh, also, perhaps uh, uh, private universities are not getting enough students. So we're not very sure why this is happening, but the enrollment of universities is declining um, progressively. Uh, TVET is low, but increasing at a very high rate. In fact, compared to basic education, it's the highest. Uh, again, the government has uh, popularized TVET. Previously, you are aware that uh, um, students had a very negative attitude towards TVET, but they are, they are now increasingly going to TVET. We suspect perhaps they are seeing that TVET students or graduates are entering the labor market at a higher rate than uh, university. Perhaps that, that could be the issue. Uh, adult and continuing education is the lowest enrollment, which is uh, very sad because uh, our population census has already showed that we have 7 million Kenyans who are illiterate and 7 million who never completed education. So that again is a problem. Uh, secondary education, I think from what you have heard, <coughs> is increasing because of the government strategy of 100% uh, transition from primary to secondary. So that one is doing well. Uh, primary education enrollment is very high because of the universal primary education strategy. Uh, remember, we have the free primary education grants and free day secondary education grants. So primary and secondary, we are doing rel relatively well. With gender uh, equity, I know somebody talked about issues of gender. Uh, University and TVET have 40% female uh, enrollment. So we think that is a good progress. Uh, but adult and continuing education, it's the reverse. We have 30% of males 
and 70% of uh, females. So there's a gender disparity there. With basic education, we are doing well. We have near gender parity. Uh, with regard to equity issues, uh, we've noticed a big problem with regard to non-formal education and refugee education. So that's an area that needs a bit of work. And also out of school children and out of school youth and uh, adults who have no education and those who dropped out of school. We still don't have uh, good programs for, for this particular population. As I mentioned, uh, uh, the population census has given us big data on these people who have no education and uh, people who have dropped out of school. But remember, it's big data. So we need uh, data that is very um, um, more concise because the uh, census gives you even the children who are, who are between zero and five who are not in school. So that could be treated as illiterate perhaps. So we need uh, concise data on those who are out of school, who have never been to school, who have dropped out of school. That out of school population has not been catered for. Then with curriculum development, we are doing well with uh, curriculum uh, policies. We have the competence-based curriculum policy which has introduced a curriculum that is uh, trying to, to make education uh, more relevant uh, to labor market demands, similarly with the competence-based education and training at the TVET level. However, the universities are not doing well. The, the document that they rely on to guide them on curriculum is, uh, was developed in 2009, and they have not reviewed it. So that is a big problem, and that perhaps could explain why university education has not been linked properly to the labor market demands. We are also emphasizing the issue of industry involvement in curriculum development, right from basic to TVET to university. TVET is doing very well. They have already developed sector skills councils to guide them. Sector skills councils are made up of industry, and industry comes in to guide them on curriculum development. Universities have not done this. So universities are developing curriculum without consulting industry, but we have been advising them to, to do this. We are, also we are also having a problem with labor market information and skills anticipation. We have, been insist we have insisted in the policy that curriculum must be guided by labor market information, which has also not been developed adequately. Skills anticipation has not been done at all. We don't know five to 10 years from now what the labor market wants. So this is an area that requires a lot of research. Tracer studies have also not been done adequately. A few universities have done them, but we have not seen proper every university undertaking tracer studies so that we know where the, the university graduates are going two, three years down the line. What are they doing? Are they unemployed? Which students are getting employment so that we can be able to tailor our curriculum to to suit the labor market. Again, the issue of dual learning. This is a best practice we are seeing in Germany where learners are learning 50% in the industry and 50% in the classroom. This is a concept that has not yet taken root. Uh, we are still having a few industry attachments and internships, but we have not yet gone into work-based learning uh, comprehensively, so that is a challenge. With regard to quality, uh, the major challenge we have is the industry is complaining that uh, education is not conforming to industry standards. So that is, uh, that is not good feedback from the industry. Yet we have several institutions that are mandated to undertake quality assurance, and some of them have conflicting mandates. We have the government and we have professional bodies. And sometimes the prof what the professional bodies want is not being done in education. And that has given us a problem because we lack linkages between these accreditation institutions. And again, we also recommended that we have independent assessments where we can verify compliance to quality assurance. So those are the key issues that came out for quality. With regard to qualification and certification, we have the Kenya National Qualification Framework, which now requires that all institutions um, comply with the Kenya National Qualification Framework. Again, there has been weak compliance with this framework. So again, this is an area that needs a bit of work. We have also recommended that Kenya should have a database of all learners' qualifications, so that if employers want to verify qualifications, they can be able to do that. So we are lacking data in this area. 
And another area that has come up is recognition of prior learning. We have noticed that quite a number of uh, the population have gained skills in the informal sector without certification. And sometimes this is a disadvantage because uh, I'll just give you a, a quick example. If you look at uh, the ships that come to Mombasa, uh, some of them want skills, uh, skills with certificates. Our Kenyans have certi uh, skills, but they don't have certificates. So they go looking for youth in, in Tanzania to come and work for them. So we have been trying to see how they, these people with, in, with uh, skills but no certification can have those skills recognized. So that's an area that has come up. A policy has been developed. It's about to be tabled in cabinet so that we can start implementing it. So that's an area that needs a lot of research. And I don't know whether my five minutes are up. Let me just finish. Just one, one more. Uh, with regard to education and employability, when we did analysis, we realized that uh, TVET has the highest employability in Kenya. TVET graduates are being employed in the labor market, and we are not getting unemployment. In fact, it's almost at 0%, so they are doing very well. But we have low employability with university graduates. We have low employability with uh, people who don't finish secondary education, people who are early school leavers and have no education. Our greatest worry is the university graduates because they have low employability and they have the skills. So they need to be reskilled and upskilled. So that's an area that requires a lot of work. And finally, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship gives Kenyans, especially our youth, a chance to get employment uh, very quickly because of the self-employment aspect of entrepreneurship. But we have a negative attitude by the youth towards entrepreneurship. Our youth want to go into formal employment, and formal employment is not creating jobs. So we are trying to, we have recommended that uh, they should get access to entrepreneurship education, entrepreneurship hubs, and so forth. We are also recommending commercialization of innovations. Our youth have innovations, they don't know how to register them. They lack awareness. And I just wanted to highlight, in 2019, only five innovations were registered in Kenya. In 2018, 10. In 2017, 11. So if we are having only 10 innovations being developed in the country, it means that these youth cannot make a living out of their innovations. So this is another area that, uh, that needs a lot of research. And finally, there's the issue of commercialization of talent. Our youth also have a lot of talent and they don't know how to commercialize it and make an income, uh, uh, gain an income out of these talents. So again, this is an area that needs a lot of work, sports and performing arts. We, UNESCO has already recommended that sports should be used by the youth to generate decent work. And we also have a policy that recommends that performing arts can develop, uh, can, can create decent work for the youth. Uh, finally, transition from learning to earning, work-based learning also has not been done very strongly. This is an area that could give the youth experience in the labor market. Internships, apprenticeships, uh, there's a lot of, um, it's not well coordinated, linkages are lacking. So this is another area. Industries are also not willing to give the youth opportunities for working in the industry because they are required to pay them. So these are the challenges we are having with work-based learning. And finally, now I'm finishing, we have the new occupations that have come up. <laughs> this is the final now. Final. Yeah, final, final. We have new occupations that have come up due to globalization. Uh, you're aware of the green and blue technologies and so forth, uh, in economies. So we have new occupations that require new skills. And uh, I remember Minister mentioning here that we need to map these new occupations and map these skills so that we can do reskilling, upskilling, multiple skilling, and portable skilling. Thank you. Now, now doctors, I'm going to mispronounce names. Um, Dr. Seleshi? Yeah. Okay. Um, it is general manager of Elixir Research and Consultancy from Ethiopia, so please. Thank you for uh, having me today. Uh, in the interest of time, just I'm um, going to jump uh, to the major issues I'm going to talk. Uh, uh, like this is personal reflection. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Okay, so I'm presenting here is just a, re a personal reflection. So, uh, yeah, whether there is a learning crisis, yeah, it's a big yes. Uh, IGRA, IGMA, uh, the N National Learning Assessment, yeah, I have seen today the same pattern, the same trend, so declining from time to time for the past 20 years. And the causes, I'm thinking, you know, uh, like uh, uh, education reform, education when I say education is not uh, to me like schooling, it's a formal, non-formal, informal, overall, you know. And then the teacher and leader uh, development is the second. The third one is priority and coordination. So let me uh, put my point here. Like uh, in 2009, we came up with competency-based uh, curriculum in Ethiopia. But after 10 years, in, 20, in 2019, there is a, a review of our education system. Uh, I was part of it. Uh, it is, uh, the review was done by Minister of Education. Okay. The Minister of Education and uh, Cambridge Partnership for Education. I was the lead consultant, national lead consultant. So the competency based, yeah, uh, at policy level, there the are five pieces like by Abania. He was writing like policy, uh, politics policy program and then uh, a p a pr a p a program and then practice and then the product. So at policy level we are uh, nicely presented in you know, the competence based program. We do have core competencies, you know, specific competencies, generic competencies. Even at uh, uh, policy we are fine with it. But when it comes to program like curriculum elaboration documents we missed that, you know, and then the reflection was, uh, let's redo it again. So we are in a reform again. We are going to redo what competency. So there should uh, there should be a, um, a research what this competency mean, you know. Uh, and the other thing is like uh, in education, the mother tongue versus instruction languages. We do have many uh, languages in Ethiopia. Uh, pedagogically, politically, it is good that uh, children should learn with mother tongue. But uh, we need a research. Is every mother tongue should uh, does it accommodate? You know, instruction as instruction language. So what are the criteria? So every now uh, there are around forty-two instructional languages. <laughs> instructional language, not mother tongue. So we need a research there because it is political motivated, but to, uh, children are, uh, I can see it, you know, at, uh, from my personal reflection, disadvantaged because they are going to revert to Amharic or English later on. So this is another one. The other uh, thing we need reform is teacher and leadership de development frameworks. Uh, just now, uh, you know, uh, only 30% of our graduates, uh, teachers pass the exit exam. So there is mismatch between teacher education and the school. So this is another. Uh, the other thing is priority and coordination. Just in 1994, we have a policy which neglects uh, ECC or ECD or preschool because it assumes to the community, religious institutions and the like. But in 2010, after 15 years, uh, uh, it became a priority. But it's too late, really. So and then again, the preschool it was given to three ministers. One is the Minister of Women and Social Affairs, Minister of Health, and Minister of Education. So the lead was, at that time, you know, it's expected like Minister of Women and Social Affairs, but this coordination, it cannot uh, be fruitful. Uh, so this is also another why coordination, uh, not, uh, not only in, uh, from three ministries, we have a challenge also interministerial collaboration as well. So this is also the challenge. Uh, the other thing is like uh, then in terms of approach, uh, where should the government should intervene? Personally, preschool and primary, but is that is not only the only intervention. We need the transitions from preschool to primary because the only uh, access till now is 36% because we do have four to six 
age is 8 million, but the access is only 3 million. So 1.8 million children are joining grade one without any readiness. So the transition from pre-primary to primary, primary to secondary, from secondary to university, from university to world of work, you know. So this is also another uh, that will. The other thing is in Ethiopia, you know, always when we talk about human capital, uh, the argument is, you know, oh, uh, like uh, the youth population is like less than 15, uh, is 40 percent is below 15 years. From 15 to 29 is 30. So the less than 29 is only 70 percent. But really the argument is, yeah, because children born not only with uh, empty stomach, but with uh, a talented brain, you know, the answer is on our human uh, capital development theories, strategies, and the like, you know. So uh, we are focusing on uh, use, you know, usually, but in Ethiopia we do have 21 million illiterate adults. So adult in non-formal education should be the priority as well, you know, b because it's a continuum. Uh, like human development is not uh, like for only for the children, schooling and the like. Uh, the other thing is uh, the prayer should be in tertiary as well, especially in teacher and leaders uh, development. And the other thing I want to uh, 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 talk about is the role of development partners. In Ethiopia, there are a lot of do uh, development partners. They are doing well technically and financially, but sometimes there is a limitation of uh, thinking in a silos, like JICA is uh, uh, focusing on mathematics, like USAID on mother tongue, uh, CFGO, the previous DFID, like focusing on le leadership for learning. So it's good that there should be a focus, but there is no capacity as the Minister of Education to coordinate and channel to the proper, you know, coordination capacity. So this is also one. The other thing is like, uh, always I'm thinking uh, s uh, education versus skill. <coughs> like human capital, uh, I, I read your website as well, is education, skill, and health. But uh, uh, like skill is like there is a, m a lot of misconception because as education sector, we cannot deliver public health and uh, social workers, they came up with the protection and the prevention skills, you know, like HIV protection, you know, early marriage and the like. The ec most of you, I, I thought, you are from ec economic background, from labor market skill, like entrepreneurship and the like, you know. But uh, after long experience, you know, like uh, as if skill is not an education, so you have to bring back the concept of education, whether it's a labor market skill or uh, this, uh, what you call protection or prevention to our education system because education is not, uh, I'm not talking about education like equivalent to skill, to schooling, but it's broader. So uh, what is this skill meaning uh, independent of education we have? So this is my personal reflection, always I'm asking this. Uh, the other thing I want to talk is like, uh, mm, uh, 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 like the, for human capital, the now is a fashion that there is center of excellence, especially in Ethiopia. This institute, that institute, you know, but this is not by merit sometimes. So people are confusing now what this center of excellence are. So we need to be a very strict criterion as to select this, uh, you know, it may be politically motivated sometimes, center of excellence, this institution, that institution. So we need to take care about uh, that also. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, in the interest of time, maybe in the question and answer, we'll uh, come back, yeah. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
can you use the microphone, please, Lant? We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My microphone. I was turning it over to. I thought that was. Yeah, he's right there. Yeah, he's right there. <laughs> <laughs> All I was doing was turning it over to Professor Nicholas Meta. I'm from Cameroon. I wasn't saying anything interesting. Oh, so my Not booking up. So you are waiting for. <laughs> Hello. I think he's online. Hello. He's online. Okay, he's online. Sorry. I, I am online. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear yes. you. Yes. Yeah, sorry. We well, I, to come to I was I was reading the name tags wrong. So. Oh, okay. Hello. But you can't hear me. So. The mic should come it's okay. Yes. 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 I can take the floor? Yes. Okay. Thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to share uh, some view on... Uh, uh, you want me to start a video? Let me. It's okay. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity to share a view. I am Nicholas Meda from uh, Burkina Faso. And uh, first of all, uh, let me thank organizer for this opportunity to join this panel. Uh, we are uh, in Burkina Faso. Uh, kind of baby because uh, it's only in June the government uh, creates uh, this center of innovation for uh, development mainly on human capital development and uh, this baby was uh, nurtured by uh, World Bank and now uh, Bill and Melinda Gate uh, Foundation because uh, uh, all uh, process to develop a national strategy on human capital development was funded by World Bank at uh, the, the time of uh, Pate Mohammed. And uh, then uh, all the process to develop uh, the feasibility study of the center and uh, the process uh, to set up uh, the center. All the, the process were founded by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. And uh, the focal point was uh, uh, Natasha Quist for uh, Dan Peter to remember in uh, which uh, channel Burkina is in uh, Bill uh, Foundation. So thank you for all the support of uh, partner to set up uh, to this baby in Burkina Faso. And now we are prepared to grow. And uh, this kind of uh, panel help uh, Burkina Faso Center to understand what is going on in human capital uh, development area through Center of Excellence like uh, EARC. And I go through all the framework paper you sent. I think it was uh, nine. And uh, really, acknowledge the quality of what uh, I have uh, uh, shown. And uh, let uh, take uh, give my reflection on uh, chronologically on all the paper sent. For example, starting with uh, Pritchett paper on uh, component of human uh, capital development in terms of uh, a life cycle economic wide framework for human capital. I uh, perhaps uh, will, uh, in this paper, 
many he said in terms of uh, education, in terms of health, in terms of demographic uh, uh, transition, but uh, perhaps in terms of education, what uh, is lacking and uh, our friend from Kenya is talking about is, is uh, the, the, the model of uh, general education producing uh, youth uh, unemployed and the potential of vocational training and that uh, parent and uh, youth people don't want. But where job is, is in uh, vocational training in Africa. So perhaps research is needed to really re transform perception of uh, community in terms of uh, what kind of education Africa needs to increase job possibility for uh, young people. In terms of uh, year, early life human capital uh, investment, uh, it's uh, clearly that uh, we have a lot to do because, uh, for example, in Sahel region, less than 5% of uh, children went to uh, preschool. So how we can develop their capacity to succeed in primary area if there are no stimulation at uh, preschool level? Only uh, less than 5%. So why this situation exists needs some research to propose to policymakers the way forward. For direct uh, investment in human capital development, perhaps uh, it was not clear for me what is uh, the objective of this paper, but uh, it's up to our government, it's up to our government to, to direct uh, foreign direct investment to what we want. We cannot complain that uh, investment is not what we want and have the control of the government. It is up to us to direct this investment to our priority, to our, our need. So on UNTEP uh, human capital in Africa, I uh, have some reflection. If uh, we go to all the uh, indicator we use to measure human capital development. To my sense, it's major uh, feature. The World Bank and this, uh, index measure future human capital development. But this is uh, uh, clearly for, it's not really talking something to policymakers. What policymakers want, uh, policymakers are thinking about the next election. And uh, you are sitting in Kenya, you know what next election means. So for next election, uh, policymakers want the level of existing human capital that looking for job and that looking for uh, social uh, uh, progress. So how to measure, for example, the Ministry of Education Human Capital Development Index, existing human capital to see if this human capital level is a one Kenyan or Burkina Faso need to increase or to improve education uh, in the country. We have only a measurement to see what the next 20 year human capital development will be. But currently we have people. What is the level of your, the human capital? So this measurement gap exists and uh, perhaps researcher can address. And uh, this is what policymaker will learn and will uh, better use for the agenda. 
for uh, other things, I have uh, really little to say because it is uh, clearly that uh, those are priority in terms of uh, household prosperity, in terms of uh, uh, low quality of uh, principal and school supervisor and uh, the problem of uh, supply in uh, human capital uh, uh, framework and uh, learning crisis. Burkina Faso is clearly, and uh, many countries in the Sahel region are clearly in this situation, how to continue education in area with uh, security challenges. And uh, if uh, some uh, research uh can give us the way forward this will be welcome to finish perhaps uh, i can encourage uh ERSC to continue this kind of panel to create a culture of evidence to always do what we know work in our context and is through this kind of process we will uh, achieve gender transformative uh, social and economic development policy and uh, thank you for uh, uh, convening me in this panel perhaps later if there is some question i can add uh, more in terms of reflection thank you thank you very much that was uh, interesting reflections on burkina faso and the challenges there um we'll move next to alexandra posarak who I have listed as a former lead economist of the World Bank, which I have no idea what the former applies to, but she's joining us remotely, and she can explain that maybe. Um, hello. <laughs> Hi, Lance, and uh, very nice to see you, and uh, nice to see my colleagues, and thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this panel former means that um, uh, I reached the retirement age, I retired from the World Bank. Um, so it is really former, now I am a retired person. <clears throat> but I found your uh, presentation very inspiring and actually hitting the nail on the head ex extremely powerfully. Uh, just for uh, for people in the audience, um, uh, the last three years before retiring last September, I was uh, based in Pretoria. I was a program leader for human development and a lead economist. And um, uh, my portfolio included seven countries, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Botswana, South Africa, uh, and Iswatini and Namibia. So before I uh, make a few points, uh, I wanted to say that uh, uh, when I was a program leader, we decided to uh, prepare what we called notes on um, integrated approach to human capital development. While I was still uh, doing uh, uh, the job, uh, we did two, and Muna, with whom I collaborated, can tell you more about how the work continued, but we did the two notes, two for Iswatini and uh, uh, for Lesotho. And the way how we looked at the human capital was to look at the key sectors contributing or the most important for human capital development, uh, health, education, social protection, nutrition, and water and sanitation um, through the life cycle of a child. And then we looked at the preschool age or birth to five years of age, um, where we looked at the, and then the school age and then uh, youth to adulthood or youth to uh, uh, child labor market uh, transition. Uh, and then we would look at various interventions at each particular stage from all of those uh, sectors, identify the, uh, the gaps, and then uh, uh, what, identify what was already there, and then propose uh, some key interventions. And the word here is on key interventions because you can't do everything uh, at the same time in all sectors. 
uh, in the short run, medium term, and the long term. And I, I noticed that at the opening of this uh, uh, event, there was a mention of country uh, case studies, and I would really highly recommend that you work together uh, with uh, um, staff of the World Bank, particularly Muna, and who is the manager for education and other managers, and then uh, program leaders for human development and collaborate on developing similar papers for other countries. Now, I come from, I was born and I grew up in Yugoslavia. And um, when the land was mentioned that a person born in 54 was 60% likely to learn basic uh, uh, learning and uh, math, um, and today it's 20% uh, of the kids can hope to uh, reach basic, attain basic literacy and basic math skills. Um, I was thinking, why? What happened? Uh, because in all of the countries in Africa, and I spent three years, not very long, but I learned something. I can't really say that I learned everything that could be learned. And I firmly believe that I only know that I know nothing, uh, as uh, uh, as all the Greeks used to say. But um, uh, what was obvious was that countries were spending significant amounts of uh, public uh, uh, resources on health, education, social protection. Yet the outcomes as in terms of human capital index or in terms which I think is much more uh, telling uh, basic literacy and, uh, uh, and math skills the outcomes were really not very good. So then you ask yourself, why? Why is this happening? Of course, there are many explanations for each sector, but still, I am not really sure I understand or I, I have some idea of what the, the true answer is. Uh, perhaps, Lant, you, I know that you have been involved in this for a while. You and your colleague can say something. Sure, when I was growing up, and I started school when I was six, that means in 1960. 1960 was 60 years ago. Um, most of the countries at the time were actually darn poor in terms of... Uh, uh, real GDP per capita, they were actually poorer than countries today. Yet the probability of uh, um, attaining results in school were much higher. So how can one explain this difference? In Africa, obviously there was a battle between expanding access and uh, at the same time improving quality or providing decent quality, and I'm talking about education now, I'm not gonna talk about other important sectors for human capital development. Uh, the fact is that in many African countries, there are 150 kids in, in class, 60, 70, what can you do? I mean, just imagine you're a kid sitting in a classroom on the floor, with 150 kids around you and you can barely hear the teacher. Um, but there is one, um, and thanks God, we didn't have in 1960s RCTs, which I have a opinion on RCTs as they have a pretty much on everything else, but I'm not very big fan on them. They are very good for people who are doing them. They make a lot of money, but not much useful is coming out of them. So uh, going back to the issue, what is it that it's making kids not to learn? And one of the small issues is an issue of teacher force politics, politicking, and what the teacher actually teach children in their classes. And um, uh, in a few countries where the children were actually, uh, the teachers were tested for for the knowledge they have and for their competencies. It turned out that many of them 
know less than what they're supposed to teach the children. So probably that's one of the explanation what it, it, of reasons uh, of what is actually happening with learning. So how does one deal with the issue of teachers? I am not going to name the country, uh, but in countries where I worked in some of them, teachers were actually had excellent pay. And uh, in, in one of the countries, they spend the entire year asking for more money going on industrial action, not actually teaching. So children lost one full year of uh, uh, learning just because teacher wanted to get some more money. And they said, OK, if you don't get us higher salaries, you are not going to work. Then COVID happened and again, distant learning country not ready to do the distant learning children lost a lot of learning not to mention that many teachers refused to teach because they just said okay we want higher salaries because you know you're not paying us enough so how to resolve this issue of teachers who cannot teach or at least the testing shows that they have not sufficient capacity to teach the content which they are supposed to teach. Because at the end of the day, teachers are really very important ingredient in all of this. If anything, the kids are getting smarter. So I have no answers. These are just reflections of what I have observed, but something has to be done. Um, at the end of the day, the future of each of these countries and humanity depends on how we prepare our, t our children for the future. Thank you again. Thanks. This is all. Thanks, Land. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us and for those insights. Um, it, we'll have to have some conversation between Kenneth, you and me about RCTs, I guess. Uh, <laughs> although I noticed Kenneth laughing that they do do well for the people who do them. Um, that the people who do them are not stupid. Um, so uh, we'll next move to, to Muna, who is a practice manager in education and global practice for the World Bank. So Muna. Um, th thank you so much, and um, thank you for AERC for having me. And it's great to see the Gates Foundation doing this kind of work. They did it in Nigeria when I was there, bringing together policymakers and researchers, and it's great to see it continuing in... in Hello? Oh, okay. So I think um, a lot of people had a lot to say, so I won't... I, I would repeat, have a lot of time. So I'll just go through a few points of areas where I would love to learn more. Um, and could be useful to, to me, and I would consider myself maybe more of a practitioner or on the operational side. So from the operational side, areas where I have a lot of questions given the, the audience, maybe this would be a place where um, we could get some, some guidance. So first is on improvement. So we, we talk a lot about the problems, but we do know that there have been some significant improvements. So one would be gender parity. What we know is that there is gender parity in primary school. And so how did that happen? What happened historically, politically, um, by the, what happened to bring all of these actors together and the families and the communities to commit to bringing girls to school when we always said that it couldn't happen because communities didn't want to, parents weren't willing, and not only did they do it, but this now has implications for these communities. You have a first generation of girls who are finishing primary school. So I think it would be great for me to learn and understand a little bit about what worked and why. Not in the, I mean, impact evaluations are fine. I, I won't get into that debate, but more just on these things that happened at scale. How did they happen and what were the factors that brought it together so that this did work? And this goes into some of the historical things that you raised. So, but things did work. So it's not, nothing has ever worked. So trying to learn from that. 
I think second from from my point is COVID. For the first time, we're all working in the dark. We this the shock happened. Um, kids, some kids came to school, some kids didn't. Some sit use remote learning, some didn't, and, and it's kind of a black box of what is happening in these communities in these countries. And at the same time, we're pouring in quite a bit of money to try to support governments in these efforts. And I think for researchers who might be close to the ground, who might have research students, they can send out. Out there I think just the more information we can have on what's happening and how are communities dealing with these challenges what I've seen is in a few places I've gone you see schools are adding an extra hour to school they're bringing in tutors so people are doing something there's a response from the communities and trying to understand a little bit more around that I mean we, we see that the, the double increase in adolescent pregnancy in um, in Kenya. You've seen there's a huge drop in learning among the poor in Uganda, but people are doing something and trying to understand what's happening and what the solutions are, I think would be great. I think the, the uh, and I just have two more, which is around um, inequality. I think what COVID has done is again, brought out the importance of addressing inequality. And there's different ways. Like I, I saw there's a paper by Ben Piper who's gonna look at foundational literacy. So there it's really, without having to say you're dealing with inequality, you're dealing with inequality because when you're talking about foundational literacy, you're really talking about those that have been left behind. So some things are interventions and some are just trying to understand what are some of the institutional constraints that are continuing to produce inequality in countries. And this connects a little bit to how we group countries. I, I see, um, you know, we, we say Africa, and I, I, it's a it's a very strange term to me because Africa is so different. Um, Nigeria, the north and the south are it's like different countries when we're talking about Kenya and Somalia. So anything where we even, even when we just say Kenya, I'm not even sure that's the right. And I know that you, researchers have to balance the being generalizable and making big statements with um, things that are a bit more granular, but it would be great if we could get that balance right between the big, the big statements and the things that actually um, matter in specific countries or, or across countries. And maybe that's by grouping them. I mean, the, the World Bank just had a Sahel education education paper, so it's bringing the Sahel countries together because they have some similarities. I don't know what the answer of that will be, but I think being able to balance the big statements of Africa or West Africa with the statements of places that have a very unique and specific challenges that might be similar to each other. Um, higher education and skills has been talked about a lot, so I, I don't need to repeat that, but um, it seems like a huge waste of public resources when we send, when government sends someone through many years of higher education and then you teach them technical skills. So I do wonder what is the answer there? I don't know. It's you, I don't know if we can blame the governments because youth are asking for this. Youth are demanding for university degrees. And so how you balance what the youth want, what the market is asking and what the providers are providing, I think would be very interesting to hear who's done it well, how have they done it well, because you have a lot of actors with very different viewpoints um, together. And, and second chance education has been been raised and I would you know Lant you've just talked about the huge number of people who cannot read we cannot forget about them they are there they are working they are mothers they are fathers and they, the, what we can do and what works to support these people to go back and get some even basic literacy we know we used to try it many years ago these programs kind of fizzled out and not much came from it I do think that it's something that if we're serious about ensuring all people have productive lives we need to think about it and what works and my last is just FC I don't cover many FCV countries, but I don't think that we continue, sorry, for, for fragility and conflict and violence um, countries, the, the issues they face are completely different. The systems they are dealing with are completely different. They are continuously dealing with shocks and how we think about them and how we think about what works for them, I think would be really interesting for me as, as I think through some of these issues. So, I mean, this is the right audience. I'm sure there'll be a lot to learn and, and thank you so much for having me. So far, the record setter in terms of least time is Ben. Sorry. Thank you for the comments. Uh, and you are the record holder for least time taken, so um, which is a objective metric at least. Uh, uh, now, I think um, Professor Wanchikon, is he online? I can't see who's online, so.
Ah, there's Leonard. So Professor Wanchikan is joining us. Uh, he's been a, a collaborator on the Rise Research Project we've been, and he's and I mentioned in my I mentioned in my um, intervention that a lot of this was going to depend on political commitments, and he's been doing. Of course, he's been doing lots of <laughs> very interesting research ar uh, around a broad array of things, but he's been doing very interesting research on education and policy deliberation in Nigeria. Uh, he's, of course, free to speak about anything he wants, but uh, I'm hoping he'll talk to us <laughs> about how one gets local engagement, successful local engagement on uh, education issues. So, Professor Wanchi. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I really enjoyed the presentation so far. And, you know, learning crisis, even if, you know, there might be some disagreement about measurements and uh, employability, you know, relevance of ed education and skills on the job market. Um, that 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 great, and I think uh, the urgency, the sense of urgency and bold action that are needed as well well received. Um, I'm going to make three points. So the first point is that I think um, we focus almost exclusively on supply, on what the government should do, uh, the various policies, and not enough on demand, not enough on the issues of parents, parental investment, uh, students' motivation, uh, community and government agency, ownership of the policy. And so that's really, really important, not only on learning, but also on job market outcome. Obviously, um, you know, someone who is highly motivated, who is resourceful, is far more likely to learn and to be successful than somebody who is far less. You know, you see, for instance, young Africans, um, you know, leaving Africa, maybe uh, after five years, they come to the US and Canada, and they are at the very top of their profession because they are confident, because they are determined, they are highly motivated. So, so it's really, um, so that's, that's, that's about demand. The second point is that we, we need to not only uh, think of the what, but we also to think about the how. It is not enough, for instance, to tell, um, to provide a range of policy that should be put in place to improve girls' education in Northern Nigeria. We need to also talk about how this should be done. Particularly, maybe one key requirement is to engage with moderate religious leaders. You know, it's not enough to say we want this, but for instance, think about the institution setting that will make this happen is very, very, very important. And uh, socially, you know, we know that many young Africans are, are educated not only by their own parents, but also by the extended family. So teaching uh, student monitoring, for instance, is something that should be redefined to involve not only the mother and the father, but also aunt and uncle and the community at large. This is how this used to happen in, for instance, the place where I grew up. You know, so to 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 you know to to put these kind of ideas in practice, you know, as uh, Land had been saying, as I just said, I, you know, with a team, uh, we actually um uh, implement a project in Nigeria in which we instituted with a number of states uh, what I call what we call policy deliberation in defining education priorities. Basically, what it consists of is that in some locations we organize, first of all, we collected data on priorities. And then there was a, a summit, a you know, a day-long discussions about the priorities, and at the end, the writing of a social contract between the participants, you know, like teachers, parents, uh, religious leaders, NGOs, and then this in the presence of the governor and his or her staff. And then later on, we measure various outcome, not only tangible outcome, like, uh, you know, learning outcome, like learning, but also 
you know, teacher motivation, parental investment, and government, uh, and also government uh, fin I mean, like financial commitment. And the primary results are really stunning, you know, because of the public nature of the discussions, because the public commitment that were made, you know, there was a sense of coordination, a sense of political commitment that makes things easier, you know. So we're still collecting the data, but the direction are really, really important and, and, and stunning. So this is just an example, for instance, of how you can basically make, improve education by improving the process of decision-making in education, you know, and how you get, so first of, how you make sure that the, 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 the process get us to get be better informed about the policy you know you know because i mean for instance you have uh, when you get people to speak you learn more about priorities you more, you learn more about aspects for instance that you might be missing and then second you know one of the mechanism which is important the sense of agency the sense of empowerment and ownership of the policy and that can translate not only into time investments to improve you know but also financial investment because for instance many of those communities have uh, you know individuals from the diaspora or living in cities who when they are engaged they can actually be able to to cover some of the budget gap that may that that, that might exist you know so um i think uh, to finish i think uh, it's really really important that we promote you know social contract at local at local level by sort of making but 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 by making um but but not by engaging the different stakeholders um through what philosophers call public reason you know where policy that are made are explained publicly debated so that you can have mutual commitment you also have a, a sense of social contract that will get things implemented you know and this practical example that i gave in nigeria that we are going to hopefully to uh, to expand shows that this can be done you know this can be done in a very say practical way thank you very much thank you very, thank you very much leonard um that was a, a rich and interesting discussion of uh the how which um i fully agree uh, there's a lot of discussion of what works that ignores the how of the what. How does the what, the, how does what works work um, is often as, as key to the what. Um, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to pick up my microphone and I say deep and important <laughs> things. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Leonard, um, for that. Um, I'm not sure if Stefan Durkan is joining. He was going to try and join us, but he wasn't sure he'd be able to. Is he not? Is he on? Can someone switch to gallery and we'll see if he's on and call him out? <laughs> uh, he may have had to. He was saying that he had to teach, and I'm admiring his commitment that he would drop out of our <laughs> to teach. Um, uh, so we are now um, at. 108 um we were supposed to have wrapped up um we were supposed to have floor intervention and discussion from 1245 to 115 so <laughs> i'm proposing that we not uh push too far into lunch but we do have about um on the order of 10 minutes to take uh comments or um uh interventions from the floor I don't know if anybody in the room would like to say something. Um, one, we'll start with, has somebody got a microphone that we're moving? <laughs> so we'll start with uh, Professor Dirk. Right? Um, or, and then any other in the room want to follow up? Adrian, maybe. Oh, OK, great. And then. If there's a way, if someone can mediate 
from those joining us uh, remotely if they'd like to say something. So go ahead. Um, thanks, Lant, and, and, and all fantastic uh, presentations. Um, I think uh, Professor Wonchanel mentioned the, um, the issue about supply and demand, and I was thinking that perhaps he was also going to uh, think a little bit more around um, uh, the issue around what is the, what is the demand and use of, of human capital. Um, the, uh, and, and I think your paper, Lant, also highlights that in particular with, with the life cycle uh, theory. And I think that's, that is very useful. And it's also that when we think about human capital development, um, and I'm an economist working mostly on trade, investment, economic transformation issues. I think much more on the demand side than on the supply side. And I just want to highlight one or two issues um, uh, that, that, that I came across also last week when I did some, some interviews with the companies uh, here, like the Isuzu and uh, Coca-Cola and, uh, and, and those sort of, uh, those sort of the, the bigger companies here. Um, and is that if you're interested in human capital, development that perhaps sometimes the answer doesn't always lie in uh, education policies um, either and uh, uh, and although I do think that of course we need uh, that most of us will be thinking around the education policies the health policies uh, and rightly so in, in, in early stage um, uh, ch child development um, and you are expert there but I think we should also think around the uh, the importance of non-education policies that can help human capital development. So ju just to sort of think about an uh, Isuzu, like a, 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 a car company here, um, if you think about digitalization of the company and how to progress that, the answer wasn't necessarily say, well, there's, there you need to have to think about the supply of skills uh, uh, first. They first said um, tariff policies. They want to have, they want to import certain ca capital, uh, capital technologies which can then help to develop a company, which then needs skills, which can then help to develop uh, human capital on, on the job learning, which may then provide incentives through the, uh, the, the, the human capital uh, development system in terms of training, which can then lead, f provide further incentives down, um, down, uh, downstream. Uh, they mentioned, uh, and other companies mentioned finance, so that they need to have access uh, to, uh, to finance, to think of, uh, to finance innov innovation. Um, they mentioned um, perhaps a number of other issues that are linked to making uh, li better linking education institutes, training institutes with companies, so for placements, for example, um, and uh, uh, and those sort of issues. And I think also that um, that what um, the practice leader uh, for World Bank was mentioning is about shocks in in fragile context, for example. Sometimes, if you need to develop human capital, you need to just um, protect countries against shocks, and they, these are sometimes macro, macro issues as well. So it's just to highlight that particular issue is that, um, is that sometimes the answer lies in, in uh, linking education policies with investment policies, it, it, it might be linking with finance, fi finance policies with, with education policies, and in that sense uh, the demand side for, for human capital is, is very, very important, and, and a range of policies could be tailored uh, and targeted in a, in a much more in a much better way to, to foster quality human capital development uh, and that perhaps links also to the, mi the minister's statement um, who said that there was still a, a large gap between uh, education uh, institutes and labour market needs and, 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 uh, uh, and how that can be done uh, is, is perhaps also an important area for, for further research so the leadership around uh, coordinating those various actions between uh, the, the companies and education systems that uh, that can then link better together. Uh, let me stop there. Uh, but that's it, it's perhaps too far, uh, very far removed from some of uh, the interventions from 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 uh, from the other authors. But I think it is something we should forget, uh, and, it, and it fits on your chart land around human capital development spending, not just the fir uh, first five years of, of life, but uh, 40, 50 years, isn't it? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone uh, joining us remotely that would like to say something? <laughs> There's a good, uh, a very good question coming of what the break is. Um, so I think in order to not uh, stand between a very long session and food, oh, sorry, one more thing, and then I'm going to wrap up and hand it over to a baby.
microphone to you and then we'll I have uh, three comments. Uh, one is why do we need to reinvent the wheel when actually uh, all we need uh, maybe the information may be available. Why don't we use uh, the best practices, success stories, or what has worked uh, in the real world? Uh, for example, we heard from Karyuki how, for example, this TVET scheme has worked where like, they have registered uh, zero unemployment uh, we have also a success story like of ARC, where they have managed to build capacity for economists and agricultural economists, uh, which I, I feel something that maybe can be scaled to other disciplines to build capacity in Africa. Uh, from like uh, existing uh, evidence, uh, we, we hear, that, for example, the dual system in Germany, especially at higher education, uh, has led to like zero unemployment. And from experiences of other countries, the role of the teacher is very key, as mentioned by uh, previous speakers. And uh, actually, like, for example, countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, they reformed their education system based on the best practices from other developed countries. And as we talk now, actually, they're even performing much better than uh, the countries uh, maybe they, uh, they copied from. Uh, the other issue is on uh, why can't we leverage ICT to produce, uh, to provide mass education and quality education at a very low cost? And now this is where, like, for example, our good donors can, what, uh, can help. Uh, then the other issue is on, uh, um, even if like our African countries were to develop, uh, were to develop over 10% per annum, we may not be able to absorb all of the, our youth, even if we train them and the like. So, uh, I was of the view, if, why can't we internationalize a curriculum of maybe like selected, uh, maybe like disciplines, which for example have huge international uh, demand. For example, there's now a serious shortage of nurses, IT experts, engineers, and scientists. So that like now, our graduates, once they finish, they can compete favorable in, in the global world, uh, in the global uh, market. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We've had a very uh, long and I think productive morning. I, I wanna conclude by, I have a son who's a physicist and I, two things from him related to acceleration, which is you're assuming Kenneth that acceleration is along a given line. Whereas the key to, uh, the, the main thing I learned from my son who's a physicist was everybody says something's not rocket science when they mean that it's not really very hard. And from his point of view as a, as a physicist, rocket science is really easy. Rocket science is just delta V. And delta V is just F equals MA. It's two very simple formulas. Rocket implementation is really hard. Building a rocket is the hard part. And so drawing on that I want to say when I say accelerate I mean change course <laughs> and that requires a lot of delta V delta velocity is what the change is and F equals MA it's mass times acceleration we have hugely massive set in train bureaucracies and agencies that have this enormous inertia so what we're trying to uh, is answer is how does one change that inertia in a more positive direction over time, which is, I think, what you're working on of the difference in the capacity and the capability and, and things like that. So anyway, so I think hopefully we've had a useful morning in thinking about Delta V. How do we change the education system to be move into a more productive direction? We've had, I think, a very useful set of comments. I'll turn it over to Bebe to uh, yeah. direct us. Thank you so much. Uh, Land, uh, and thanks everyone. I mean, uh, you agree with me. It's uh, uh, it's been uh, an interesting session. You know, when human capital is uh, a bit addictive, when you start thinking about it, there is nothing else you want to think about because it's uh, fundamental uh, to all what we do um, as as uh, experts, uh, but also as human beings. Basically, 
if we cannot change the lives of people, the gadgets will not <laughs> help much. So, so the, the story we have heard today uh, is supposed to energize us, to also inspire us in terms of uh, the frontier research that we, where we want to take, uh, because there is a lot of back and forth. As Lenin says, <laughs> forward and one step backward. Uh, uh, so, so basically, uh, it has given us uh, a moment of reflection uh, and I'm sure uh, the practitioners, those of you who have done the thing on the ground, listened to the researchers, and the researchers also listened to your views, uh, and especially the minister, you know, when he was uh, narrating the things they are doing, you can just feel the economics behind it, uh, the gaps, and, and also the logic that's driving their policies uh, and uh, I'm sure this has been very helpful. So what we do now, it's about half past uh, 1 p.m. Uh, so it's time for lunch. You have been very, very patient and good audience. Uh, so uh, Natalie, the lunch is served outside? At, at the foyer. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, they have just started service. Excellent. And then we resume. Uh, maybe we give a little bit more time. So people, some of them have come a long, long way. So they may need a little bit coffee more and to stretch their legs. So um, we're supposed to come back at uh, 2.15. So are generous only by 15 minutes. Because it's less than an hour, huh? uh, if we come back. Okay, let's come back to 30.
teams in terms of their thinking about their specific country? And I think that's a hard and interesting question um, because, you know, again, the essence of an academic paper is to be, uh, I remember one time I, I wrote a paper which I thought was an academic paper and I submitted it to an economics journal and I got back a referee report that said, this is one of the most interesting and engaging and original things I've read in the past 10 years. Unfortunately, it's not an academic paper. Because <laughs> an academic paper takes a very narrow question, very specific question, tries to make some chip away at some modest progress on that. And what this is, is this broad kind of ranging thinking. So I guess where I'm really pushing, and I'm going to pick on Kenneth, because Kenneth was very articulate earlier. Um, I, gu I guess the question is, OK, Kenneth, we take your paper as it's written. Could you write, or suppose you were going to write two pages of, it's almost like you were writing thought questions. You're going to have a reading group that read this paper, right? I don't know if you, now they have book groups in America where they have a book and then part of the process of the book group is they have a set of discussion questions. How hard would it be to take your framework paper, for instance, and write a set of two pages of questions that should occur to you if you're a think tank working in your own country on the human capital agenda that you should ask yourself um, and hopefully have some answers to as you move ahead with uh, kind of thinking about policy engagement on these issues. Does that make sense? Okay. And, I, and I'm picking on Kenneth, but I'm going to pick on Adrienne in a second too. So. Do we have to hand the mic? We've got two mics, so we'll hand them around. This is Kenneth. Or, yeah. Yeah, apparently those don't work for our um, audience. I mean, that's a provocative question, so I'm not sure that I can come up with a, with a good answer in like the 10 seconds that I have before I have to give. And that's what I meant by to, pick on. Yeah. Um, I don't understand. Why is this clicking? There we go. Now it's on? Nope. I might, my microphone is clicking in some. So I, I mean, I think that the, the thesis that I have in the paper is that that the the base level of training, the base level of, of capacity is there. And I want to be clear that when I say that, I don't mean no doctors ever need to be trained again and they shouldn't go to medical school and they shouldn't get continuing training. I'm just saying at the current levels of training and the dynamic current levels of training, we have something, right? It may not be as high as people want it to be, but we have something. and. There are many, many w different ways to, to augment that and get that going. I think the thing that, well, let me, be, let me just go, yeah, let me go to the most provocative thing, which is, I think, what's your point, right? To what degree are you willing to accept, and this is a question for African policymakers, but also to a certain degree, anyone who is African, to, to what degree are you willing to accept policies which are essentially neo-colonial, okay? Uh, neo-colonial. Right, in the sense that if the donor, for example, sets a uh, pay-for-performance program that says, this is what I want to happen in a maternal and child health clinic or hospital, and I will pay doctors to do it, and the evidence is quite strong that they will do it, right, if they're paid to do it. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that a well-designed pay-for-performance, performance-based financing project can get good outcomes. Not, I mean, not at a reasonable cost. And this is where the neocolonialism comes up. Of course, it's ridiculously expensive, but it's being paid for by Norwegian voters, right? And then the Norwegian voters are told, these are the safe deliveries that you purchased. These are the vaccinated children that you purchased. Here are pictures of happy babies in Chad or Nigeria or wherever you want them to be, right? That will be an improvement for health. But the point is that the doctors in these government-run facilities are now being told what to do by Norwegian voters. 
is that acceptable? Okay, or is that just, you know, so when are you going to, because those programs are not being handed over to be fully implemented by African governments yet. I haven't seen any attempt to do that. It's still being implemented by donors, okay? So is that worth it, right? A huge portion of the agenda, and this varies a lot by country, is being set by donors, right? And it's not that the donors give you the money and say, use this money for good ends. It's that the donors are saying, this is what I want to see. These are the things that I want to be implemented. To what degree is that acceptable? Right, so that's provocative right there because I feel very self-conscious coming in and saying, this is what I think a doctor in Rwanda should be doing, right? Why should I be the one who decides what that doctor should be doing? And when I talk to that doctor, he has a totally different set of objectives, right? So, so I guess that would be, I'll come back and think of a one that's less controversial, but I'll pass it on to Adrienne right now as I continue to think about it. Because to, to my mind, that's one of the, the, the innovations is this idea that we can actually create and to get back to your language land there what it is is we are taking the governance capabilities of the norwegian you know foreign affairs office and we are importing them into africa and we are leaning on the shoulders of their their implementation capabilities do we want to do we want to import capability and if we import capability are we giving up and importing someone else's agenda How about that for controversial? Yeah, I, I didn't, I don't, I'm not sure oh, I you. was provoking you to be provocative, but I did, apparently. Because I'm, I'm, I'm also interested in a, uh, a more, again, a more prosaic thing, maybe, which is, oh, sorry. I'm interested in, in, in a, maybe a, a more prosaic thing, although this, this is headed somewhere there, which is, um, Uh, we're assuming that we have these nine framework papers that the seven country think tanks can read them and in and of themselves there'll be adequate guidance for them to construct a kind of forward-looking research agenda about country uh, prioritization of what they really should look at and what the key questions are for their country and i'm i'm doubting that that's true i'm because uh we when we write these papers are embedded in this broader background of issues uh and i think adrian's paper is a good example like there's a whole bunch of stuff about education systems and you're looking at one very particular personnel question um it might be, it would be helpful maybe to have like a two page addendum that says, here is how, here's the broad context into which I see my paper fitting. And then secondly, if you were moving ahead uh, with doing this, here are the practical sorts of questions. And I think the paper about foreign investment <laughs> has very similar features. It's like, look, I've written this paper, but it comes from this broader background that doesn't necessarily fit into a paper qua paper and leads to a set of questions that aren't necessarily answerable within this paper. So, Adrian, say what you want. <laughs> sure, thanks. Um, so I feel like my paper really, at least my intention of it was it is a big question, right? So I, I think I think you're completely right that it's looking at the entire system um, but focusing on a very specific actor in it. And I think it's an actor we know almost nothing about. And so I feel like in thinking of the framework, it was <laughs> this actor has been largely ignored in a lot of, if we think about um, transforming education, and, and for those of you who have not read the paper, it's really quite excellent. Um, it's really not, but that's fine. Uh, but it, it's focusing on this head teacher layer and the school supervisor layer. So thinking beyond the teachers and thinking about you know who the teachers' managers are. And so I, I think that they've been largely ignored. Um, and I think that from a country specific, I think there's a lot of space for them to be more understood 
And then is that as well as if they're not delivering, and I think you know your graphs have shown they're not delivering the service level that is expected or that is possible, um, the question is why? And so kind of a deep dive into understanding what are the constraints of these managers? Is, is it because their teachers are lacking something? Is it because their parents are lack the parents of the students are lacking something? Is it the students are lacking something? Is it because the principal's bosses are lacking something, right? So understanding, you know, which where the constraints are coming from, are they coming from above, are they coming from below? And I think we want to think about, and I, I know, Lana, you love thinking about systems. So if we think about the system, I think we have to understand kind of the constraints of each actor. And so that's kind of where I was, was trying to to get the country teams um, to, to go with that paper. So I, I hear that as a, I hear that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> that you think you could write or or we we could commission someone to read your paper and write like here are the here are the discussion questions from Adrian's papers and do you think that i mean so so you so i hear that as a at least a qualified yes that we a third party could take your paper and write a set of two pages of here if you're five people on your country think tank team are going to talk about this here are the questions that you should be asking yourselves and answering amongst yourselves in order for you to decide what on this agenda would you move ahead with as a country team yeah i mean i think that's a great answer okay okay good so you you already put your name up so like in traditional International organization. International, yeah. Um, now you mentioned the paperland, and I think, um, uh, I mean, I suppose the uh, uh, one of the questions is is how deterministic would you like to be um, uh, or not? Um, uh, but in any case, I think it would be a really good idea um, if there's space to for someone to sort of synthesize what are the key questions that come out which are relevant for the country case studies. Um, in in for, for my particular paper I've, uh, I've finished with five questions you could be asking mm. um in the country case studies if you're interested in doing a paper on fdi and human capital in your country uh, but i don't know to what extent countries uh, teams will actually do it uh, or whether they will be compelled to do it um, and um, but um i i, I think there may be um, a more translation that is needed from this paper to I think the country teams, because this is specifically on FDI, but I think there's a more wider point around how how do does um, the supply of human capital uh, from early on link in with the labour market, with economic policies, uh, etc. And I think that is a more wider point that I think that could be asked from 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 the country case studies to sort of look a bit more at sort of how, how uh, linking into your your framework paper land is what is the use of human capital, how is it being used, as well. And sometimes the link is. is Lots of different steps in between, isn't it? If you got primary school uh, or even before, then there, and then you think start thinking about how is the human capital going to be used. So there are lots of steps in between, and it's, it may be complicated. And the country teams want to not focus on that, are not set up, haven't got the expertise to be thinking also about the demand side. But I think um, it is worth a question, um, and I mean there are five questions at the end that you can use, but uh, of, of the paper, or more specifically, a sort of how about the demand side? What how do you think this this actually helps uh, small firms, uh, large firms, foreign firms, domestic firms, etc., uh, um, to sort of use these these particular skills um, that are being gained? Is there that link? How is that link working? Uh, we know that there needs to be coordination taking place at different levels to make it happen. How can that happen? Then how is that coordination happening? What institutions work? Uh, what don't? Um, uh, what may, perhaps what is best fit, like, um, um, best practice um, in this context. Um, so there's lots of questions on that. If uh, and, and sort of happy to sort of so, uh, extract some some more information from from this paper, more generally about I think what aims you have from your framework paper. But I don't know to what extent actually the country teams are already set up to do particular uh, to answer particular questions and whether these questions are one one step too too far for them or not. That's my initial reaction. Claudia? I can't I can't see who's on. Can you show me? <laughs> oh, 
I know Claudia was on earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, Claudia, I, I think in some sense, your paper with with Jer with Jerry kind of fits this framework paradigm maybe the best um, in that you have generated a really quite specific approach to the question you were dealing with. So uh, so if I pose the question, you think your paper as it stands is going to be adequate guidance for the seven policy think tank countries to move ahead with on the domain in which you've worked or would there need to be additional diagnostic and or questions asked? And again, starting from the premise that I think yes. in some sense your paper seems like the paradigm of here is an analytical approach to deciding things that has been widely adopted. Yes, actually I think that our paper is very policy oriented. We provide economic evaluations of different interventions that are proven to have impacts on during the the course of life. So I think that is very very good for advocacy and for, for policy making. Although we do not provide a very important aspect of implementations of those policies. So it's more like we focus on results and, and impacts, but we do not focus on how to implement those policies in a specific context. So I think that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm, uh, I guess we're, we're, <laughs> we're calling on all the authors. So, uh, Professor Mwabu, do you want to say something about your paper and how it's going to feed through to the to the country teams? Get the microphone down. Maybe Francis can uh, can say something. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, Thank you very much <laughs> for the opportunity. Um, our paper, first of all, uh, try to link up uh, human capital, specifically uh, education and health, to household prosperity and social inequalities. It is largely based on trying to indicate the various uh, methods and processes that they could be used in order to establish uh, those linkages. And in the process, we realize, you know, that most of what we can measure is probably smaller than what is unobserved. And the critical issue is trying to see how to open the black box and see what could be explained, you know, statistically, using econometrics. And we believe that it is equally important to, to try to see really what the people say, to put it, you know, vis-a-vis -vis to what the data is saying. There are so many other dimensions of human capital, like Professor Mwabu explained uh, previously you know, nutrition, you know, and other aspects of human capital, that a country a case study would try to find out, for instance, which is the key dimension of human capital that is likely to drive, you know, the process from the, its acquisition, its production, you know, to prosperity, thus household well-being, and to how it can help to scale down social inequalities. So it's uh, to say that one can just now probably if they gave us the opportunity to 
to tell us that what we will be expecting, some critical uh, policy questions. Because for now, our main issue was trying to make sure that we propose re uh, pre uh, you know, methods that are replicable, methods that can be, you know, and make sure that we handle those methods rigorously. And equally to make sure that we take into consideration the fact that what we cannot handle, especially because of the scarcity of data in Africa, we can acknowledge it and try to see what from the unobservables, what we can extract, you know, in terms of the normal endogeneity, you know, of continuous variables and dummy variables, sample selection issues, as well as unobserved heterogeneities, you know, those are the type of things that we're drumming up and equally to indicate that, you know, the method that we're using, the control function, is a powerful method that can help through those measurement issues and equally to demonstrate somehow the power of uh, regression-based decompositions. In this case, that element equally of regression-based decompositions is possible for us to you know, move away from the difficulties of trying to you know, establish thresholds when we're dealing with multi a dimensional poverty and all the like by using regression based analysis that we are going to extract the possible the dimensions what we did we extracted the human capital dimension and to express it in in money uh, metric units as opposed to scalar and from that we are capable of deriving thresholds that are somehow compatible with the monetary poverty threshold when we use a non-parametric type of analysis that you don't define you know, a functional form, but you are capable to see in that money metric uh, version of that dimension of uh, poverty or well-being, which is the turning point that we can be able to separate you know, those who are deprived of that dimension and those who are not deprived from that dimension, which can help us to go ahead with uh, the multi-dimensional study of those issues and equally to see how inequality plays in those issues. We equally you know, propose how uh, we can establish a factual, basically I don't know whether Prof. Epo Mwabo have some other thing to add. Thank you very much. You know, actually, he has uh, explained very well our motivation for the standard and uh, how we carried out the standard and uh, how it can be used uh, to do further analysis. So I have nothing more to add. But if you ask some specific questions, I can answer. Sorry, what? If you ask some specific questions, I can actually answer. If you ask some specific questions on our paper, I can answer. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, so this is just a really practical um, question. Is I thought that the framework papers have been submitted, and then I thought the country case studies had also already submitted their grant applications. And there was a steering committee that looked at them. I'm getting a me from Lant and a yes from uh, Professor Baby. <laughs> I, I just have a, a follow-up point on what what you just um, um, mentioned, Francis. So I thought your paper was was really um, really excellent and um, and. Uh, it has a lot of a lot of calculations in it, a lot of estimations uh, for a variety of countries, and you can look at it in two ways. So one is to say, well, we've got a method here, and we need to replicate it in the other countries that ha aren't already covered 
um, and so you've provided methods, um, and and others can can use that uh, in, in in other countries. Um, the other is to sort of say, well, let's take those numbers, let's take those data, let's take those returns to capital or returns to human capital, and uh, and let's think behind it. Um, what 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 lies behind it, um, and. Um, and so, so there might be returns to um, to, to education uh, that are, that vary by sector, uh, whether it's informal, formal sector, whether it's in different locations, whether you've got different characteristics, um, and so on. And um, and you've got a lot of a uh, lot of high quality estimates there. Uh, you may want to so the country teams may want to look at those numbers and may want to put them into wider context. If that's the only estimate there is, then use those. But if there are a number of other estimates that are there, put it in context, and then think through what next on that, um, what do you do with those estimates? And uh, on the one hand, sort of those, often those estimations are correlations, not necessarily causation. Um, and so there's still a question as to why are, the, are uh, certain returns higher than in other locations? Uh, there sometimes are, are questions on that. And with case studies, you can, you can get to that a bit more. You can get to the causalities. You can have some more uh, before or after. You can get some more details behind those numbers. Why, why, why are those? numbers really high in certain sectors. Why is it that particular sectors uh, or that, that, that people um, that have a particular level of education that are, that are working in a particular sector have a higher return to that education compared to other sectors? Well, that may be because there may be more demand for those and that then actually link to the demand side uh, of, the, uh, of the equation um, uh, as well. So you, so you could, um, you, you, you could um, uh, th think in those terms. And then there's another, uh, another question is, uh, so what do what do you do in, in terms of policy? I think you your framing is is that that even though there might be vari a, a, a variety of estimates across different locations, across different income groups or diff uh, different, is that your, your the policy implication could still be let's have a general horizontal education type of policy, but you can also say uh, argue, and that's something a question you could ask to the to the country teams as well is to sort of say well actually. We, we have all these, very, uh, these different estimates that vary s s uh, significantly across uh, locations, across, uh, across uh, characteristics. Is there a policy question that you need to target your policies much more than, than you would otherwise have been the case? So there is a, qu there is a case for targeted human capital policies, mo much more focusing on sectors, on locations, and, and so on. And, uh, and, and there, of course, is, is a general debate. But, uh, but I, uh, so one is to sort of take your paper and the methods in there, which I find very useful, and those would, I think, Policymakers will benefit from those numbers, um, but the other is to go to say, well, actually, let's take those numbers and then and then think about the policy context and let, do a bit de a deeper, uh, deeper analysis behind them. Um, so that's just my two-hander on. Mm, yeah, I think there's a, a useful, uh, uh, you know, c comment and suggestion because, um, you know doing a framework paper you can go to those details but country case studies are expected to go to those details to explain why there are heterogeneities as uh, as you are saying and equally to as i said it, in a country case study it may be interesting you know you have seen what the data is saying to also see what the people are saying using all sorts of uh, qualitative type of analysis you can think of the basic uh, focus group discussions and other possible ways, you know, to try to explain some of those black boxes, as we're saying, you know, because not everyone have discovered that what the data is explaining is just a fraction of what is happening. And, uh, you know, so it's very interesting to see why are they heterogeneities across the various groups and across the various regions of each country, and as I said, to identify, you know, the dim we have talked about, as I said, human, you know, education and health, but there are other dimensions of human capital that could be, you know, the missing link that can link up, you know, human capital acquisition to household well-being and social inequalities. Maybe one thing I, may, I must mention, mention is um, that uh, we have received very severe criticism on this paper, okay, both on the side of methods 
and on the side of, uh, of its application. But um, we also disagree with the, some of those who, the, who, who are not happy with our paper, but we have received very strong criticism. Criticism. Do you want to hear one of them? <laughs> uh, this is a free world, so I'm not a framework paper author, but I, I've been uh, with the team uh, since the beginning, so we, we have uh, so I know some of the journey. So uh, fr from the question uh, raised by um, uh, uh, Kenneth on how, for instance, we perceive this donor-prescribed interventions, uh, which are done very well in an experimental setting and has given and yielded very good results, uh, and the protocols are well followed, so it gets published in very good journals. But when everything is said and done, uh, would this have this external validation? Like the governments, would they say, ah, we didn't know uh, what you had experimented gave us an insight, so we are going to improve this performance-based rewards uh, etc. So Kenneth is saying he has not seen that happening. So why is this blind spot among the African policy makers? And then when you top it off with uh, what Lant is saying, uh, and also the lady from World Bank, Africa has been prospering, but deteriorating on its human capital. So people like me in their 60s, uh, my schooling was not great uh, compared to the kids now that we have in my country. But why is there no learning? And I'm sure if uh, I'm shown something, I will be able to read and uh, say something about it. So, so this uh, uh, learning crisis, I, I have heard say our education minister saying, we are in a total generational crisis in parliament. He made it very clear. He said if it were up to him, uh, the entire educational system should be disrupted and re, you know, re overhauled. The amount, I mean, it's like the list goes on. I mean, you guys haven't even touched anything. When he was sharing his experience in a few months, what he has seen, uh, the amount of uh, incompetence, the degree of uh, children uh, literally uh, shirking on their education, coping at uh, tertiary level, uh, stealing and etc. and teachers and students colluding and uh, regional administrators to make sure their school is the best. They were cheating. So he was saying like a kid starts cheating at the kindergarten, finishes university cheating, and then what do you expect? This guy becomes again a politician somewhere. So we are generating uh, this uh, 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 people who are literally destroying the country. So, so uh, for me, this agenda of the human capital development, it's not just one country you pick Ethiopia. I could not even imagine a country I could say, okay, Maybe Seychelles, I don't know. Maybe uh, Mauritius, who's done very well in education. When you look at it, it's it's like a continental, a continental uh, di um, uh, drift, where the education system seems to be neglected from North Africa, Southern Africa, from West to East Africa. So probably um, this wake-up call we are making is important to my view. Say, if I'm asked about the performance-based thing, it's about relative position of teachers, uh, health workers in society. In my day, for instance, if I were asked what do you want to be, I would say a teacher. 
because you know teachers were highly respected even though some of them graduated from 10th grade in Ethiopia the teacher training institute would accept teachers at 10th grade in those days like 40 50 years back today they have degrees and then they were tested by this gentleman he was telling us and all of them failed <laughs> the, the certification you know to be qualified to teach that course because they were given the same exam that they had been uh, administering and uh, these people were not able to pass so 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 in terms of this uh, supply side the incentive structure from top to bottom there seems to be a neglect of the sector both education health look at the health sector at least what I know from Ethiopia is the private and the public are competing. So doctors work like 16, 17 hours, but they prefer always to be in the private one. So they send their patients from the hospitals to the clinics where they work. And then when you go there, they also send, give you prescription for all kinds of tests in the private uh, laboratories. So, so there is a bit of capture at every stage. Uh, in 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 those so so my my view is that yes uh, governments have to really reset their priorities they have to think education is not just about increasing productivity opening opportunities no it's a survival for a nation if you want to have a, a, a prosperous nation your school system speaks for itself this is what I have anyway I've had a chance to re rethink my question in a more politically correct way, uh, my my response in a more politically correct way. But so I think getting back to to Andreas' paper, like we're identifying a middle a middle layer between the providers and the policymakers, and I think I think we should all realize that that's key. And one of the questions I would have for an individual country case study is at what level are you willing to authorize someone to make independent decisions about changes, like significant changes, right? How will you measure their outcomes? And then importantly, what will you do if they do not come up to standards, right? Within the context of civil service, so it's not that, you know, I mean, that's the problem with a public clinic. If it's failing, you don't close it, right? If you have a doctor who's not performing up to standards, you can't fire him. Civil service doesn't allow for that. So those questions need to be answered within each country, within each context. And and the reason I, I, I talked about the, the sort of neocolonialism, which shouldn't be included in, in anything that goes forward from here, is because when I talk to those people, like a, someone who runs a hospital, so they have a staff of 200 people, and they're forced to make executive decisions, even if they don't have the authority they will lay out in detail, and these are just WhatsApp phone calls with these people, they will lay out in detail the creative decisions that they made to keep the hospital functioning, to get the health workers to show up for work, right? And then at the very end, they will clearly point out to me, you cannot tell anyone <laughs> what I did because my funding will be cut. I violated the rules that this donor put on these resources. I violated the rules that the government put on my use of these things. They broke all the rules that they were given in order to achieve better results, right? Now, from my perspective, I think it's very interesting that they were able to achieve these results. They understood how to rearrange resources, and I think it would be useful to, to, to let them loose and say, okay, you're not bound by these rules. And I don't know if it's a hospital director, and I don't think it's a principal. I think you have to go further up. A principal of a elementary school is maybe not the level, but that, it depends on the country. Where are you going to give them the authority to make these decisions? And then what are you going to measure? And again, what does failure mean? So I don't think in this context you can say, if you do not succeed, you're fired, right? No one will sign up for this experiment, <laughs> right? But those are the kinds of things. So that's, I think, what I meant. And, and, and to, let's assume we don't want the donors, we don't want voters in Norway telling these people what to do, but how do we insulate these people so that they can learn and do, they're not doing an RCT and we're not doing an RCT, but they are experimenting and we're comparing results across people. 
give give someone the authority to try and solve these problems. I guess would be the way that I would put it. Oh look, we have a third bank. Ah, uh -huh. we are wealthy with resources here. Help us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you once more. I've, I've just been inspired by his contribution, the last speaker. Um, indeed, what I get from his uh, contribution is that uh, we at our level, though can give some indications, but the burden of doing what is relevant lies on the researchers and their interactions with the policymakers to come out with key issues. So what we have to provide, I believe, is to provide them the, the tools that they can use in analyzing whatever issues is relevant in their country. Not telling them the issues that they should tackle, but allowing them and encouraging them to discuss with the policy class, the private sector, and other influential bodies to come out with critical issues concerning human capital development in their country. Thank you very much. Yambati yeah, Francis, since we have, we have done work on this area, can we suggest it to them what they can uh, analyze further? Well, as I said, it's, you can just suggest a very broad areas or possible areas that could be handled or studied, but not inclusive, meaning that you give room for other bright ideas other bright issues that they think that can help, you know, to push forward uh, the human capital development apparatus. Thank you. I'm hoping you look at me. Because <laughs> um, I, 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 I was very impressed by your earlier kind of description of how policy making and what Kenyan government's doing. Um, and as I see it, there's different ways in which one can imagine that research influences the agenda of governments, one is, and, it, and it's always, one is, here is what the government of Kenya is doing now. There are some specific granular details of the design of what we're doing now that we hope research could help us with, right? And that's one kind of modality of engagement in the policy space is we're going to do TVET and there are all these design issues around how TVET should be structured or carried out or how we, you know, choose things. But then there's the second thing, which is things that we just aren't on the agenda, things we're not thinking about, things that we don't have a program for or and sort of calling to attention that this is, you know, this is something that, you know, isn't isn't currently within the structure of programs we have operating, but needs attention. So, as you kind of think about this kind of research program, do you 
what what would you hope to get? Are you more interested in kind of things being pointed out that, oh, gee, we hadn't really thought about that, we need to incorporate that into our thinking? Or do you really think that think tanks can be more helpful to you on the granular kind of policy design level? Or both, or nothing, or just I'm provoking a response from you. And I, Yeah, I think you've, you've raised a, a pertinent question that um, gives us a lot of problems in government because uh, we would like to develop policies that are informed by research. Many times uh, we don't have this kind of research and so we have to keep calling stakeholders to come and give us their feedback on what they think we should put in the policy. And then we have to depend on um, on research that has scant, scant research that has been done. So the researches that are being done definitely would inform policy. And I think the, the best route, of course, would be to involve the policy makers uh, when disseminating the research, when carrying out the research, at whatever level, you could involve the policy makers so that as they develop their policies, it is informed by the research. So I would say it is a good practice. But uh, on our side, uh, research that informs policy is very limited. So what you're doing is fantastic. Maybe I can elaborate on the value of research in informing policy with an example of uh, health care financing in Kenya. Now, the policy makers focus on um, reducing user fees, uh, sometimes providing free care, and also building more clinics, and also providing insurance with the hope that people will come and use the services. Actually, what is ignored and which research, only research could have uncovered is that um, if the government does all that, there will be very little utilization with the free care, with the facilities available, and so on. Because we have to look at our context, our setting. For example, who takes children to the clinics? It is the mothers. Then you look to see the amount of work, of t sorry, amount of time that women spend on household production, fetching water, fetching fi uh, firewood. If you look at that, you actually find that uh, mothers are very poor, uh, have a high time poverty. They really don't have extra time to take their children to the dispensaries, except when they are very too sick to be helped by the clinic. So, uh, actually, recent work shows that uh, if we relieve women of uh, time poverty, that increases the uptake of care and therefore improvement in the, in the, in the health of the mothers and of the children and everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good example of how I think things tend to get designed from the supply side because that's what the government controls and doesn't adequately think through, well, wait a second, what's really the binding constraint uh, to, you know, if you look through the entire kind of <laughs> production function of adverse outcomes, where is the where is the constraint? And often it's the health seeking behavior because it's really costly. Um, so that's that's a that's a good example of the kind of thing that 
a researcher could bring that isn't necessarily encapsulated in the program design in the first place, right? So, um, so I, I guess <laughs> turning to Abebe, it's like I think the framework papers at this stage kind of are what they are, is my assumption, right? We're not. This isn't a workshop in which we're planning on asking necessarily for another round of revisions because they're all, I think, in the shape that they're are going to be in, and they did what they said they would do. Uh, mine is probably the least completed of all of the papers, so <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, I, I like to feel it's pregnant, but it certainly hasn't delivered yet, so I need to put a little more effort into that. Um, so, but I do think the, at a kind of, I, I'm trying to think whether Adrian's question I don't, maybe you and I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that they really use the framework papers as much as I would have hoped. Um, you know, so yes, we did get proposals from the think tanks as this is what they were gonna do, but as far as I could tell, they were kind of reasonably sound proposals of what they were gonna do, but they were pretty unconnected to any direct cause and effect. Oh, because we read Adrian's framework paper, we're going to look at this, or because of the five questions about FDI, we're going to do that. And I was, I think, uh, and so I think my perception is we're in the position of having done some really excellent framework papers. We're in the position of some think tanks moving ahead with stuff. I think the highest value added might be some, you know, there might be super high return to some modicum of additional effort trying to get the think tanks to more internalize what the key messages of the framework papers were. And, you know, some of the, <laughs> that might, you know, that, 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 that was, I, I guess, if, if, from my point of view as kind of what I'm doing and how I'm seeing the overall project, I think additional revisions of the papers are low value added because the papers are high quality and they are what they are. Uh, B, uh, you know, try and, but like I say, I, I think the most pressing question at kind of a wrap up like this is, is there some modicum of additional effort that we could induce that would <laughs> have super high returns and getting more uptake? Um, and I, and I think maybe, and, and like I say, my brainstorming idea is a sort of two-page, two page, I forget what they call in the Oprah's Book Club. Oprah's Book Club? Anybody participate in Oprah's Book Club? Anyway. <laughs> but in the Oprah's Book Club, of course, the publisher, you know, the publisher who wants more people to read the book hires people to write, you know, a page of discussion questions. So I'm just asking the authors whether they think that kind of effort not necessarily done by them because they've done the work they're paid for or don't, don't want to unfunded mandates or something one always wants to avoid um, but if we could generate a set of discussion questions do they think that would be helpful in getting more uptake of of the work in the the subsequent kind of uh, more direct, engaged with policymakers, engaged on the country level, uh, work. So, Kenna. Um, well, let me actually take your question and flip it over and see what people have to say. What should they not? What if we just say in two pages, these are things that should no longer be done? Does everyone have any suggestion from their own research that it's like, this is a dead end, stop asking these questions, or stop asking questions in this way, or something like that? Would that so the, I'm saying like we as a group, right? But that's the thing. So if if the um, if the country studies or if the, the think tanks in the various countries are moving forward, right? And we they haven't necessarily read what we what we've written, and they should read the two page summaries. But part of those two page summaries can be these are things that we know will not provide useful results, right? And I'm not, let's not talk about RCTs. Maybe we can do that beer dinner but that's the kind of thing that I that I'm asking do you know what what are the things that should no longer be done so 
I'm going to propose something else while Lant grab, uh, collects his thoughts. I, mean, I wonder about the, the personal mentorship, right? So each of these country studies, we could likely approximately map them to the closest framework paper. And then instead of, I mean, to, to volunteer nine people who have no time to volunteer their time <laughs> with no compensation, I'm looking at you, Gates Foundation. Um, that to you know, just kind of having a one-hour conversation and saying these types of things, you know, maybe you're a bit from the frontier, or that there's research that's already been done that you just maybe are not aware of because it's in a similar but different country, or you know, just something that's like instead of starting from the framework papers and saying here's our summaries start from the country studies and say, here's how to take this idea and maybe move it closer to the frontier or closer to the framework papers. See, Adrian, this is the purpose of this brainstorming. I've been waiting for this type of thing actually throughout the morning. Uh, uh, it's a brilliant idea. And, and, and honestly, yes, uh, it helps. Um, the land and uh, uh, some of our resource persons uh, in three days are going to spend time uh, a little bit on a more general uh, approach to writing a good uh, empirical paper. But then I think we will approach also some of our framework paper authors to have a little bit more time. I mean, we will compensate definitely. Uh, but we know how uh, you know the, the time works for many people. But it's a very good idea. Uh, so just um, in terms of why we organized this, I, I would just put a, a couple of points wha what ARC is expecting. One is this is one of the most successful projects we have had in the collaborative research, uh, especially being done on time. And everybody has produced very good papers. But then uh, we want to see what the practitioners also have to say uh, at some point. So the morning session is going to give a little bit of more ideas if, for instance, we continue a second phase of this project. Uh, and hopefully, if BMJF also continues to partner with us, what would it look like? So that it's not a surprise uh, in terms of uh, bridging any kind of gap. And, and the second part is also to introduce this initiative to the larger policy audience. So we are going to have even bigger meetings where we will be sharpening the messages from all of the framework papers and then from the practitioners. So we, we try to send that message. And the third part is the country case studies and uh, the think tanks with whom we are working we really want to have a bit of organic link between the researchers such as yours and them. And then also the people in the country, uh, Dr. Caroline, what she said, Dr. Sileshi, what he said, uh, uh, and uh, the cabinet secretary, what he has said. Uh, I, I can already tell you 10 topics that could be for research because they are experimenting. Uh, look at how they are trying to say the informal skills to give them some certification. Does it make any change in labor markets? They are rethinking, uh, he said actually, skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. And, and uh, uh, God knows what it means, but it's a lot, of, a lot of effort is being made. So somehow somebody in Kenya, for instance, can pick up, because a lot of reforms have been done in, in Kenya, for instance, in Ethiopia, in, in the seven countries. So we want our country case study researchers to see this policy experimentation and use them as a further uh, research item. So, so the idea is the proposals are not a done deal. Uh, we are going to encourage them to improve vice, to ask the right questions, the relevant ones, etc. So uh, Adrian, thank you so much. The, you know, when it comes to the the, the worker, <laughs> but but it's a good idea. So we'll present it to all the uh, uh, the others, and we try to match, and then see what, how it works. Uh. So, 
I guess one, uh, so one uh, consequence of being old <laughs> is that I've seen a lot of things and I've seen some things work and some things not work. Um, I think uh, one, so one experience that I've been involved with is on the topic of economic growth. You know, there was a large economic literature, but the economic literature about, about growth was largely using cross-national comparisons of growth rates to sort of draw very general and generic conclusions. And then I was working with a team that was, and the, and the problem is, is that the literature tended to come up with answers of the type X is good for growth, but without okay. specifying the conditions under which X was really, really essential for growth versus the conditions were, you know, it was sort of like asking, what's good for heart health? Well, you know, what's good for heart health depends on whether you're actually a reasonably active person and want to be a performance athlete or whether you're actively having a heart attack or whether you have heart disease of a known type. So they weren't adequately specific. So we developed this, this process called growth diagnostics that said, look, we can all make a long list of things that on average countries that grow better do more of than less of. And so here's this list of 20 things that are good for growth generically, but what in your specific context would be the most important of those things to focus on? Because what happens a lot is governments, I feel, tend to lack really analytic prioritization methods. So it's easy for a government to sort of be responsive or reactive and say, well, you know, we have trouble with X, so we'll have a program for X, and we have trouble with Y, and we'll have a program for Y, without necessarily being proactive at, here is what we see based on some analytical framework as being the most important question, so what we're gonna work on. Anyway, so we, what we try to do is develop a, a process of series of questions you could ask yourself about your economy, like ask yourself these five questions about this in order to identify, is it likely that this is a binding constraint to growth versus not a binding constraint to growth? Now, I think the experience with that <laughs> is that, and I'm being brutally honest as I often am, I think both sides hated it. Um, <laughs> academics hated it because it wasn't really writing a paper. Yeah, it, it was like, well, that's, that's, that's not a paper. Like, I can't write a paper saying the binding constraint to growth in Pakistan today of these 20 possible things are really these three things because I can never get precise enough to really be persuasive and convincing in the kind of way that economics or other journals now demand. I mean, economic journals are completely crazy and out of control on that, but that's on their control anyway. So it wasn't really, so the academics hated it. Uh, and and I'm, I'm being more brutally honest than I should in a public setting, but you know, Diffid gave Oxford and LSE $50 million to do this and they said, thank you very much for $50 million, but we're not going to do this. We're going to go run a bunch of RCTs with the money that aren't even related to economic growth in the first place uh, because that's what fits our academic paradigm, which is we live in a paper-to-paper -paper world. And then policymakers hated it because it was way too complex. Like, in order to do a growth diagnostics, you had maybe eight to ten different growth diagnostic potential nodes of this is a area that might be a binding constraint to growth and around each of them you were supposed to assemble five different sources of evidence of here are the ways in which this particular, if this were the problem, uh, you know, if the shortage of savings was the binding constraint to growth, 
you should see the following five things, and if you don't see those five things, it probably isn't a binding constraint. That, in terms of what any given government had the capability to do and create a government-wide dialogue around, was too, way too sophisticated. So I felt we hit exactly the pessimal, <laughs> exactly the worst possible thing that it basically never took off because it was way too hard for governments and not amenable to, what? Yeah, too simplistic in some, well, again, to be honest though, academics are smart. They choose easy questions, right? I mean, they're too smart to take on hard questions. <laughs> academics say, here's an answerable question, right? So part of the smartness of being an academic is choosing a problem that's answerable as opposed to necessarily yeah, it's got to be made practical. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so I'm rambling a bit, but I, I feel like this is a tension research. The, the interface of research and policy always confronts the paper by paper approach that is just an intrinsic necessarily part of being a professional, particularly academic, but even non-academic researcher versus the kind of heuristic, kind of prioritization, granular answers that you know people engaged in the policy process need, and it's just it's just sorry it's just very hard to bring those together, and so again, part of what I was raising is maybe there's some lubricating process of getting the quality papers we have making it a little bit easier for people to see and grasp the, from the 25 page or 40 pages of dense text, here are the questions you should ask yourself that emerge from this paper, which I'm just making a list of the framework papers kind of in front of me and thinking, I think from those, one could maybe write a reader's guide kind of thing to here is, uh, here is what one should think about in terms either, you know, and maybe what should you not do? Um, no, because I remember from Kenneth's work with Jishnu Das on healthcare provider behavior in India, he could show, <laughs> you know, and then they looked at the relationship between provider training and quality of advice, and they basically showed at existing incentives and mode of operation of the public sector providers, the public sector providers would need eight full years of additional training to reach the quality and practice of the private providers. So the immediate conclusion was training is nuts, right? <laughs> additional training of the MBBS trained public sector clinicians was not the pathway to superior performance. So you could, you could immediately say in Indian context, training of public sector things all else equal is just a nuts way to move ahead if you imagine you're going to perform performance. So, you know, maybe there's things like that that we, we could draw, so. Um, I, I don't, is there, uh, again, can, I, can we see who's on? Because <laughs> I know that Noam and, and Stefan were were meant to be on. Yeah. Is Noam? No. So we neither have Noam nor Stefan on. I was just saying that's one of the framework paper authors we haven't heard from. Do we want to check with the chat? There's three more comments in the chat. Okay. We can go to the chat and hope it's not embarrassing. <laughs> it's all process-wise. Okay. Um, so, I don't know what time is, but I know I'm reaching, I could tell by my previous comments I'm nearing declining marginal value, if not near zero, so.
comments. Uh, some comments you've made have made me think. Um, I think when you're presenting uh, documents to government, um, sometimes we don't like reading. So I would say uh, it's recommended that let's have a summarized version, raise the key issues. That's what people want to see. What are the key issues and what are the policy recommendations? Once we see that at a glance, uh, people are able to work on them. But uh, reading a document is a problem. And that's why we love executive summaries. So I think uh, if you're tailoring something for policy makers, uh, think about the time. They don't have time to read. Uh, they need something at a glance, a one-page document, two-page, that tells them very quickly what you're saying. Thank you. So maybe just reflecting on both what you were saying, again, the, the set of questions that you maybe draw out of each of the framework papers, but Adrian, also the point about you know pairing up or mentoring also with the think tanks, and maybe there's a way to, to do both of those. Because I think, again, the, the question idea makes a lot of sense, but also providing some kind of a support to the think tanks as they're thinking about then how am I going to translate that, you know, given the work I've done, given my country context. Um, so maybe, maybe part of the takeaways next steps are for Abebe and me to go back and also think about how we might do that, recognizing, of course, that all of our nine framework researchers have day jobs, and so I don't think we're looking free to just volunteer time out of, the, out of the goodness of your heart. So maybe there are other ways that we can think about that we could provide that separate capacity to think tanks too. I mean, obviously, Lance and, and others are going to be doing part of that over the next three days with the master class, but something that's, you know, more ongoing to the, and it, again, and maybe something too where you're developing a little bit more of a long-term relationship with an institution could be useful on both both sides. So I think we can certainly take that, that away. And then I just have to make the snarky comment, since Lance was saying, you know, both sides hated it. I'm not sure what it says then that the World Bank then adopted that, of course, for all their strategic country diagnostics, because that's basically what they do now. <laughs> Yeah, before every country partnership framework they do, they now do a strategic country diagnostic, which is basically the process that you're discussing, so. <laughs> I wish it were more our process, but yeah, yeah, I know, but on the other hand, on the other hand, because they face the same problem, but, um, they, they face the same, uh, which by the way, we developed the growth diagnostic because the bank was being so useless um, because before they called it the country strategic diagnostic, they had some other policy process in, that basically resulted in each individual unit of the bank making sure their agenda was reflected in the country agenda with zero prioritization so that basically they said, well, later we'll actually work out what we really do. We'll just create this, you know, what was it? they were called PRSPs. The PRSP process was just a laundry list of everything. So, so the word, the fact that the word diagnostic was in it, is a step forward, because you know if you get a government together, every ministry is going to say, well, my ministry is priority and needs more resources. So it's not like that. That in and of itself can't be the prioritization. Um, the just the input into this is, <laughs> I, I think with academics, there's often what I call the muddle in the middle, which is when I was at the World Bank, um, there was a very famous macroeconomist named Rudy Dornbush. And one of the units that did macroeconomic research, they would literally just pay some astronomical sum, honestly, to get Rudy Dornbush to come and he would, for a day, just go from office to office to office, and each individual researcher would say, here's what I'm working on, and he would give them immediate direct feedback from what he knew of the world that was going on, on what research questions they were working on, and say, well, that's just dumb, or that's been done, or that's not gonna work, because 10 other people tried it, and here's why it fails. 
So academics often have this very deep reservoir of knowledge that isn't communicated in the way they communicate with the world. Because the way they communicate with the world is very narrow, you know, narrow papers that draw on a breadth of knowledge, right? And then if you commission Rudy Dornbush, so I'm using Rudy Dornbush in part because he's dead, so he's a good example. Um, can't be insulted. But, you know, if you gave Rudy, and that cost maybe $5,000 to have Rudy Dornbush come for a day. If you gave Rudy Dornbush $50,000 to write a paper, you would get whatever paper he'd written. You wouldn't change his research agenda one iota, right? He would create what we call the moving average paper, which would be, oh, here's 80% of what I wrote before plus 20% new so I can charge you $50,000. Um, and then if you really wanted to change Rudy Dornbush's agenda, it was gonna cost you $5 million because he's busy and has lots of things of his own interest and lots of competing demands on his time. So I feel like people who fund research often end up exactly in the muddle in the middle where they basically overpay for research that would have been done anyway and under get the depth of, because they, they haven't figured out how to elicit relative to specifics, the depth of knowledge that the expertise in the field has. So, you know, the Kenyan government bringing in a global expert just to say, here's what we're thinking of doing, what do you think, might be worth 10 times commissioning a consultant to write a paper about it. Because by the time the consultant's writing a paper, it's got a lot of work that you really didn't need relative to their, and really low value added off just asking them the question and getting the answer they can give them an hour. So anyway, so it's, and this is part of the <laughs> part of the lubrication mentorship advice thing is that uh, you know um, there's more knowledge. There's more knowledge there than than can be elicited in the standard uh, standard ways of contracting often end up with way overpaying and way underpaying some things. Anyway. Um, thank you, so that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I suppose there was a bit of a discussion on, the, on how research gets into practice and policy, that's, that's one discussion. But the other dis, uh, discussion that you touch upon now, uh, which is more about the link between framework papers and, and the country uh, case studies. Um, and isn't it possible to have a list of, uh, maybe you already have it, but a, li a list of papers, um, the framework papers and a list of country papers, and perhaps do we know what the country case studies are proposing to, to undertake. And <clears throat> so at, I think if there are seven countries, there are seven times nine links. But there's anywhere between zero and, nine, and, and 69 links. But, but I suppose that is a mechanistic, a mechanistic way of doing it. But if you sort of see the title or the topics, um, uh, then, then perhaps there might be some, some, some organic links might be happening uh, also at, at country level as well. So there may be certain think tanks, certain countries that that you link with, that you know know about, so there might be some organic links there, um, that um, um, that 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 you can um, you can foster, um, and yeah, that extracting that information is not not necessarily straightforward, but it is um, it, it because it also requires sort of knowledge of all the areas, right? Sort of what are the key questions and how does it map to which framework papers? So you need to somebody will need to know what is in all the framework papers and what is what were in proposals for the country case study, so that is not, not a straightforward task, it's actually quite a complicated task. Um, but, but it might be worth, worth your while to, um, to, um, uh, to, to do that. Um, and then you can have the cross-fertilization. And the, um, I mean, I, 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 I also agree that it's, it's, it's not, not useful or straightforward to sort of impose a certain uh, structure, heavy structure that, that often doesn't doesn't work. Um, sometimes what we do with country case studies is that we sort of impose headings, <laughs> um, but I think that's already already too far, too far down the line. 
uh, I think they are so that you don't don't really have that and um, and, and also the purpose is is it to synthesize so it, is the purpose to, to con compare and contrast across countries I don't think it is necessarily uh, and then draw a co conclusion on that it is to sort of think about human capital development at a particular country level and then and then to inform the policy makers in that country rather than perhaps draw out the, the I don't know whether that is the case but rather than to draw out uh, any differences across countries from which you don't want to have more general policy implications but that is another another layer and it becomes a cost very it can become very complex um, uh, uh, as well um, but yes yeah, so I mean the, the, the drawing out those, those issues I think could be quite um, could be quite useful um, and yeah I mean on the growth diagnostics I mean can, uh, so some donors do still use it or SCDO uh, have used it in the, sort of the last few years and it's also then the officials themselves are doing it which is which is not a bad thing so they think more deeply and, and they get bold on the political economy question which I think is absolutely crucial because you I mean, with the growth diagnostics, you, you get to some analytics, you get to some prioritization by some people. Um, and then the question is how, how what? So you then need to think about that targeted solution. And then you need to, need to think about the political economy of that targeted issue rather than be general, generalized across the whole range and to say, let's do the investment climate and the world will be fine. And, I, and, and, and so the, you target. And I think uh, so it's still, still happening. But uh, and perhaps our International Growth Center helped a little bit with that. So I think it was set up just because the World Bank didn't do enough on growth. Uh, and, and it was it was it was doing a range of things, um, uh, and uh, but not necessarily it wasn't necessarily offering the support it could do could provide on growth. So then, then I think the, the, the donor at the time set up this, this par parallel structure to 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 sort of incentivize the World Bank also to do more on growth and growth diagnostics. And I think there's now this 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 this, this, this helpful dialogue that has been taking place over the last few years to sort of cross fertilize. Um, uh, uh, diagnostics across the systematic country diagnostic that uh, SEDO has something else and the Germans have something else as well so, that, so I think there, there are different ways of, um, of, of, of doing things so that may may help a little bit you may not you may disagree but no, no, I, yeah. I, I'm happy to hear we were more successful yeah than, yeah and, and, and <laughs> yeah and I mean I think yeah and, and, and also to, yeah, to influence the IDA processes. So there are, but, but different countries want different things. But I yeah. think there are now the Germans and, and, and the UK always want certain things. But yeah, I think, I think the, um, uh, just a list of topics, I think, will be quite interesting. From the country, do we have them from the country case studies? So what they're proposing? Uh, you don't have to set them now, but circulating them will be quite interesting, wouldn't it? Diana, my dear, we we have the proposal titles, right? Yeah, or, yeah. For the, for the country case studies, and and the think tanks. Yeah, yeah. So we can just uh, share with the framework paper authors. Yeah. So so they can see uh, where their interest is gravitating. So so I think you know the the process is now really to gently nudge them towards asking timely relevant question but also um, raise their ambition uh, to to do more serious work that that uh, uh, also leaves a mark on their own career so so the the idea of uh, land uh, Yao uh, Leonard and hopefully in future all of you is to create this crop of uh, uh, researchers uh, get into you know uh, uh, the, because that is what ARC is all about. So the more we bring our researchers closer to uh, publishing in decent journals, get a little bit punished, and also do push-ups as they do the reviews, <laughs> then you know the 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 uh, it will catch up, and it's a lifetime experience. So. Uh, uh, we'll share that one, but on gross diagnostics, uh, no, no, I, I, I think don't give up, uh, uh, land. you uh, of course, you have, you have, uh, you have done your bit. Uh, you've introduced the. Uh, 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 actually, last last week, uh, Diana, uh, they had a meeting with uh, uh, Hausman uh, to extend this to regional integration. 
But I think in most African countries, actually, the ones I know, uh, they do basic GD in uh, strategies. Uh, I don't know the extent to which, uh, because this is a method that requires a lot of intuition and uh, uh, consultation and, and data. Uh, and and uh, as Ken, you said, you know, you go and talk to people. So GD is basically eliciting the binding constraints from different stakeholders and then uh, uh, triangulate it with quantitative data. So it, it requires a lot of skill and deep yeah, knowledge of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, and then I think now we're at 4.30, so <laughs> I'm going to, uh, <laughs> and I just traveled 24 hours of the last uh, 36, so I'm, I know I'm at, uh, but, and, and this just is a more generic comment. Uh, one of the, but coming back to growth diagnostics just as an example, is one of the conversations I often have with Ricardo Hausman is, um, is the skill, is the way they train doctors is they have teaching hospitals. And a teaching hospital is somebody's actually treating patients and the people who are training to become doctors actually get directly engaged in the treatment of patients and learn from the experience of treating pa patients. And the difficulty, and, and getting back to the growth diagnostics, the difficulty with growth diagnostics is unless you're actually involved with one, it's hard to see how it's actually done. And, and, and I, I worked at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government for a long time, and I always used to joke that the Harvard Kennedy School was a medical school run by the Department of Chemistry. So it was a medical school run by people who'd never seen a patient and never treated a patient. So they were supposedly teaching students how to do public policy, being taught by people who had never in their life had done public policy. They were excellent economists, they were actual excellent sociologists, but they had never treated a patient. Uh, so anyway, with, if, if you think broader about how do you get more sophisticated decision making into say education sectors and human capital, I think the teaching hospital metaphor is really important. How do you get people that are deeply enough engaged in the public policy problems that they see what they really are um, and not just as Kenneth pointed out deal with a fictitious problem that's been created right um, and yet and, uh, and get them to apply a set of concrete skills because uh, anyway so and that I think a lot of the thing that's missing in the world is in the fields it's the teaching hospital it's it's informed because like when you say bringing rigor and evidence to economic policy making in Africa, that's like saying we want really excellent doctors that bring rigor and evidence to treating patients. Well, bringing rigor and evidence in economic policy making requires something like a teaching hospital. It's not academics like to imagine that bringing rigor and evidence means I write a paper and other people read it. It's no, you actually want to bring rigor and evidence into the action of policy making, and that's a practice, that's a profession that isn't necessarily rep well represented by the pinnacle of, you know, chemists. Chemists aren't good doctors. Chemists are good chemists, and, you know, physiologists aren't good doctors, they're good physiologists, and the training of the actual doctors is the tricky bit. Right? It's uh, there because, unfortunately, there's only economies to work. With. Having a teaching hospital on economies is really nerve-wracking. No, no, <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Lance. Uh, I think I think we had a good run on this. Um, we did uh, try to figure out the path forward. Uh, we are very grateful. I think the couple of points. One, we'll be sharing the proposal titles and. Uh, from think tanks and our country case study authors. So per country we have about four, right, actually. Um, so so it, there will be shared and we'll see how uh, we can create a match 
uh, for possible engagement in future. Um, secondly, uh, we hope, I think, this conversation will continue and we build on uh, the nine papers uh, and also the discussion today and see where the gaps and continue uh, a sequence of uh, research project, policy outreach and capacity building in human capital development. I think this, this topic resonates very high in, in, in all of our uh, um, research interests, policy interests. Um, it, it intersects Minister of Finance, it intersects Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Women and Social Protection, Labor. So the human capital development uh, basically is a centerpiece for all ministries uh, in our uh, cabinets. So this is going to be a very important endeavor. Uh, we'll continue this discussion today at dinner. You are all invited. Now go and rest. I know uh, some of you have traveled so far. Honestly, uh, uh, you have managed very well. Is, you know, the jet lag. And, and most of us have not traveled since COVID, so <laughs> we don't know where, which, which time zone we are in. <laughs> so I, I wish you a, uh, a couple of hours rest. I think, uh, Diana, uh, the dinner is uh, uh, which level? Where we, we took our uh, uh, group photo, right? Second floor. Okay, but okay, okay. So so around six thirty, right? Or oh, you want an early dinner? Okay, uh, okay. We can be flexible, but still, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, she says six, so that you have enough time to rest. Uh, so we'll see you later on. Thank you very much. If there are any other. Uh, logistical things cecilia and natalie are here so please consult them for travels tickets uh, if you want also to extend your stay and all of those uh, you can talk to us so we'll arrange it for you thank you very much everyone and those of you attending virtually thank you so much and god bless all of us thank you <laughs>